OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. And a very good morning to you. Welcome along to OTBAM. It's Jaron Owen with you all the way through until 10 this morning. As ever, we'd like you to be part of the conversation. You can text us on 087 180 180. That's a WhatsApp number as well. Or, of course, you can just leave a comment for us on the YouTube stream or use the hashtag OTBAM. How are you feeling about England now, Owen? Oh, you were right. All along, they're back. I didn't want to say it, but I told you so. You're, uh, you're definitely not going to be, uh, you're definitely not going to be proven wrong. About England at any point during this tournament. An utterly, utterly amazing uh, performance from England last night, uh, swatting aside the, the greatness of the Czech Republic. I mean, it's, a, it's like a, a bit backhanded. But I'm sure you've got a the bit score down. As, well, first of all, I'm sure you've got the score down as 2 0 because England hit the post and you're, you've been counting them as goals all the tournament. So well, I, mean, they I, I, clearly, I clearly haven't been counting them it's, as goals. Uh, that was the whole point. And they were brilliant after taking their early lead. Early lead. What a finish from Raheem Sterling. Uh, great celebrations all around England and yeah, after they went 1-0 up early obviously the the cherry was firmly on the cake after they, they uh, put the second in and you know they were running rings around their opposition. My main point was that uh, we hadn't seen the best of England just yet and that we really needed to see Jack Grealish in the team. I didn't dare to hope that we'd see Sacco in the team and uh, away we go. Youth, pace, not really caring about the, the pressure of the occasion. I mean, all joking aside, it was a much better performance. Hmm. But what was the pressure of the occasion? Well, uh, two inexperienced players who weren't good enough to play at this level hmm. was the generally agreed consensus. Never played Champions League football before. These guys, uh, and they were replacing players who were clearly superior to them, which, by the way, I don't buy. I think that um, that team was pretty good. We got Harry Maguire back in the team. I think yeah. England are going to be pretty confident about playing whoever's left in the tournament at this stage. I mean, obviously, they could go out in the next round because the vagaries of the draw, not great, but not great for the next game. But if they get through that, it's pretty good after that. Uh, so I don't know. You're like just, you've just decided, you made your mind up a month ago about this England team. They were rubbish. You were dying for them to go out in some horrible way, and it's all coming up. Sheehan, is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah. What a, what a morning. Uh, the pressure of the situation is an interesting one. Like, on one level, you're like, they really needed to put in a performance last night. And on the other hand, they'd qualified before the game. So I'm not, I'm not quite sure what the pressure of the well, situation Well, there was, no, there, there was no pressure in the second half. Obviously, the second half was a complete non-event. But in the first half, they needed to play well. They were under massive criticism. I mean, Harry Kane still, obviously, hasn't quite clicked just yet. But, you know, tournament... Pretty good last night. Ain't over yet. Yeah. And I think, I think they found it, the bones of a team. Like, yeah. Oh, 100%. Like, I mean... I would not be surprised if they actually win this last 16 game, but the conversation we've been having is have England been at a level that we've seen from uh, the front runners in this tournament so far, and I think what we've seen is, is that's not the case. Now, in fairness, you look at the two players they brought in last night, and it's going to be very hard to drop them. In many ways, Southgate's yeah, going to be given a much easier task with Mason Mount missing. Like, I, I always do think that there is just a... Like, when, when somebody's not there, we just place an unbelievable importance on their shoulders and, and, and Jack Grealish's stock has risen as a result of not playing. Is Jack Grealish a better player than Mason Mount? I don't think so. If you think he is, you can only make the case that he's slightly better than Mason Mount. So I don't think the net gain from England's perspective is that much, well, even hang though on. Grealish is great. But hang on, so hang on. But why, why do you automatically have to replace... Mount with Grealish. Mount was out and unavailable last night, but that's not to say that you couldn't replace one of the other midfielders with Mount. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like who who might be better for England than Phillips or even Rice, depending on I don't know were they resting Rice last night because he's undroppable and so therefore the second half he didn't come out or was he injured? I don't know. So I, I guess we won't know until the, the next team is selected. But uh, you could put Mount and Grealish in the same team. It turns out because Grealish played really well as a midfielder, like not as one of the front three or not on the left side of the front three or on the right side of the front three. He played as a midfielder and he can play as a midfielder. And he gave them an outlet ball, mm. and that's what that was the whole point that I've been making the whole way along. Is like if you give Grealish responsibility, he's going to be able to play in any of the big club teams week in week out because he's brave he shows for the ball he does that thing on the half turn that everyone's always complained about none of the other England midfielders being able to do he can pick the ball up and run at you and he's completely at ease in whatever level of football he plays because he's a street footballer like yeah. it, 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 it all seemed very basic to me and he played well in the first half the second half complete non-event and I wouldn't read too much into the, the fact that no one was really trying to leg in that at that point. It would be interesting to see what would happen if he dropped one of his two holding midfielders. Like, I would be astonished if he did it now for the biggest game of the tournament. 
Yeah, because like, it looks like he's been building for the biggest game of the tournament with this very defensively solid setup. Like they haven't conceded a goal to this point, and uh, that's the most important thing from Southgate's perspective. It looks like. Yeah, well, that that is a, a, a genuine positive. The, the fact that they haven't conceded a goal and they, they haven't necessarily. I know Suchek had a big chance last night. They haven't really given up like a whole pile of clear cut chances that look like a systemic failing. I know that the Scotland fans might disagree with that and say they could have pipped England, but they, I wouldn't necessarily say that there are there is a, a repetition to how England have conceded chances where you're like a team could uh, split them open and destroy them. I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. Just what I'm looking for is just something on the level of the, the front runners, considering this is a home tournament essentially for England and is confirmed as such essentially as a result of of last night. And maybe Grealish is the answer. Like, and, and maybe he would have just uh, in, maybe in the next game he gets even better. Um, it's just and like uh, what you're saying there maybe makes sense on one level, but maybe it makes sense on a FIFA level rather than a, a, on a reality level. What do you mean on a FIFA level? Like, like dropping Patrick doesn't think you've ever said. Go dropping on. Declan Rice or Calvin Phillips and bringing in Mason Mount and. Uh, just thinking that that would automatically be a better England midfield. Well, than can Mount not British do? Can Mount things. not do what Phillips does? I mean, like, what, why? Why can't he do that? Yeah, maybe he like, absolutely can. Yeah, like, and it's just about having the bravery to do it. Or, like, I don't know. I just think that the room in the team from now and taking him out after that performance would be mad. Taking Phillips out of the team after his performances in this tournament would also be mad. Uh, so, like. Well, well, like if you if you can play a twelfth man and Mason Mount comes into the team, of course it's better. I'm just looking at these combinations and, I, and I'm like, what what is the answer that leads to a massive uptick from this England team? That that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying like there were. Did there, you not think there was a massive uptick in the first half last night compared to what we've seen in terms of the fluidity and the attacking intent and everybody seeming to know what their role was? Mm. Did you not think that there was a significant yeah, difference last night in the first half? Yeah, it was it was definitely a bit better. Yeah, for sure. And they were, they're go, they're going into this knockout stage in a really good place. And as I say would not be surprised to see them beat whoever it's going to be. So tonight is going to tell a lot on that front. It, it depends who they actually want to get. Like with France, it may actually be a case of just both teams surrendering possession and hoping that they can counter with Germany. Uh, maybe it could be the same thing. I, I, I don't know. They, they might perhaps want to get Germany in the next round. I think that's probably the draw they might want, um, even though they were so good the last day against Portugal. I think that, that uh, Southgate will feel that he'll have answers to some of the, the problems that, that Portugal were, were caused by Germany on Saturday. How exciting was it to watch Saka? Oh, like, very exciting. He's, he's brilliant. Just, like, I think he's pretty much played in, in every position bar one or two for, for Arsenal at this stage. Maybe, maybe goalkeeper and centre forward are the only things he's, he's maybe not played in uh, for Arsenal at this point. And he, he can do anything. Like, even, even if he changed up the system in the morning, he could he could fit into a into a different setup and uh, you do wonder if at this stage they're just getting him in the team, but like that when he's twenty two he might be an out and out striker as like a as somebody who's just a we're going to get the ball to this player uh, as often as we possibly can and ideally as close to goal as we possibly can. Mm. Yeah, like that that could definitely be it. I'd, I'd also I'd love to see if it is Germany, what well, what would be the the thinking with regards to the Southgate's team? Does he just go with the team he started last night and and Sterling and Saka as your two wide men who essentially will who have the possibility to kill you on the break? I think that that's what they might go for. But he's himself and Grealish have both played their way right into the team as a result of last night. So it's, Phil Foden's gone. You're dropping Phil Foden. Well, I mean, we, if, I'm not sure if you've seen this, but uh, Jeremy Cross in the star um, said uh, up until now the closest we'd come to Gaza had been Phil Foden's new haircut but Foden has been more of a red herring than a blonde bombshell leaving Gareth Southgate no choice but to bow to public demand and throw Jack Grealish into the lion's den um, I think that if it's uh, between those two Grealish has got the nod but if it is between Saka and Foden I think that's maybe a little bit more complicated Foden's obviously the guy who had the jersey at the start of the tournament it would be ridiculous to suggest otherwise it's just interesting that Southgate trusted Saka rather than Sancho with the starting spot last night, which suggests that a positive performance from Saka would have would have been almost confirmation bias, where this guy can really challenge for a starting spot. Man of the match last night. He think I think he's he pretty has good. Like and and again, I just think look, Foden is excellent, but I wonder if I don't know, I don't know if, if is Foden a better bench player. If if you're thinking about how this works now, right? If there's not that much between them, and you're concerned about the the kid. I mean, they're obviously both kids, but the lesser experience of the two being able to influence the game off the bench, do you leave Foden in reserve and have him come on in the second half when things are a bit stretched? 
Yeah, maybe. Like, like these conversations all sound really exciting, don't they? Like, and this is the, like we're back to the point of talking about this brilliant English generation of players and the depth that they have, like fantasizing about what team he's going to start for the next round is just a, is a really exciting thing to talk about. Um, and like, I mean, when it comes to that specific decision, like I think if England have been crying out for just a little bit of spark and they got that last night from Grealish and Saka, I don't see how you can drop either of those players. Basically, yeah. As a result of what we've seen last night. Yeah, I, I think you're right. The the one caveat might be that they they did feel like they were already through. It, and it's also hard to know is the fullbacks that he picked last night are they now first choice? Luke Shaw's played back to back games. It would suggest that that probably is the case. He is his first choice. And then Kyle Walker played his second of the three games. Mm. Does that mean he's ahead of Reese James and Karen Trippier doesn't even get a look in at right back? It's interesting. Like I mean, the, with the exception of Luke Shaw, really, that that Maguire Stones Walker partnership is back and that was the partnership they had as their three at the back pre-tournament and in qualifying and when they were playing really good football so and maybe maybe they maybe that's his idea is that you can actually it can be three at the back depending on certain times in the game that gives you the tactical flexibility within the match and that's a bit more interesting i suppose if you're if you're southgate yeah 100 percent. like i mean and then they have good options at, at left at left wing back and obviously Trippier then can come back, come into his best position I think which is that right wing back which just has been a position that's not been available for him so far this tournament it then means that Foden would probably be a better option than Saka on that right hand side it'll be more of a narrow role maybe and then on the left probably Sterling does keep his place um, so like I'd, I'd be I would be surprised at this at this stage if he did change to three at the back I think that you've got your formation why would you play three games especially last night you would try it out last night if you were going to go to three at the back because you were already qualified so I'd, I'd be surprised if it happened but it's, it's another option and it's like again when we talk about England there are just so many it's it, it's like a Rubik's Cube and whatever side you look at it looks bloody attractive and they're, they were an outstanding team on paper I, I'm ju just except waiting on the for field. the kick exactly well it was except on the field until last night I would have said in the first half when I thought they looked decent so and there's still loads of room for improvement I'm not saying by any chance of the Brazil 1970 just yet it's 42 minutes past 7 OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette good morning start with Gillette put your best face forward with their new and improved razors here's what's coming up between now and 10 o'clock I'm going to go uh, talk to Phil Egan get his thoughts on the Euros and round up everything that's happening in the world of sport at the moment sports pages is 5 past 8 Keith Wood's going to join us to talk about the Lions at 8.15 uh, John Duggan's going to join us at half past 8 after that Chris Stark is going to give us an England fans perspective Brendan Deveni and David Brady are going to preview the proper start of the Gaelic Football Championship which is just days away at this point and uh, Sonny Pike the story of uh, the uh, best footballer you never heard from uh, last night at half past nine. I do want to tell you that Off the Ball will be the home of the British and Irish Lions tour to South Africa. Full live commentary of all nine matches, including, of course, the three tests. Brian O'Driscoll and Alan Quinlan are going to be alongside Neil Tracy for commentary of the three tests. Devon Toner, Neve Briggs, and Jack Carty amongst the co coms for the warm up games, which all starts the pre tour match. It's the uh, Irish Lions essentially versus Japan from 3 o'clock with Neil Tracy and Andy Dunn this Saturday all of the Irish players playing are either starting or on the bench for the game a little bit of an opportunity for some revenge against Japan a dish best served cold obviously it will be served with uh, Haggis and Tripe by Neil Tracy and Andy Dunn from 3 o'clock this Saturday afternoon it is uh, 7.44 Phil Egan is with us Phil good morning to you how are you? Morning lads how are you doing? Uh, I, I'm I'm you know, as a Villa fan, I'm delighted for Jack Grealish to get his opportunity last night. As an Arsenal fan, Owen seems to be a little bit like, well, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that everybody deserves to see our Wunderkind play like this. It's a, an exclusive Arsenal thing. Well, keep playing like that, and he won't be an Arsenal player for much longer. <laughs> you, could, you could say. Wow, True. he was that good. He was that good. Well, I'll take your word for it because I was all over the Scotland game. I was looking at Scotland, the game that had something riding on it. I know England obviously had to win to, to claim top spot, but I was saying, could Scotland break their duck and qualify for the, la the knockout stages of a major tournament for the first time? And it was quite apparent after Croatia scored the first goal, it wasn't going to happen. Now, when McGregor scored and he, it was one all a half time, you thought, do you know what? They might have a go, but he just couldn't get the ball off Croatia. Modric put on another masterclass and his goal was unbelievable. And when they do the montage at the end of the Euros, Scotland will feature in the prominent league because of the Patrick Schick goal and because of the Luka Modric goal. Phil, it's an amazing goal. It's absolutely sublime. There's not yeah. too many other players in the tournament who could have done what he did in that moment. 
but you could kind of see it coming, not least because of the, I want to say, 10 metres of space between Luka Modric and the nearest Scotland man, the lingering outside the box. When Luka Modric is the man who's arriving late in the box, should you not be a little bit more aware as a Scottish defensive unit of what is about to happen? Absolutely. And unfortunately for Scotland, that was just the case all night where Modric got way too much time on the ball. Now, you could argue that there's no problem giving Modric time on the ball if he's to drop really deep, which is what happened in the opening group game when England played them. Modric was having to drop deep and get the ball off his back four. You know, he, as good as he is, he's not going to do much damage from deep in his own half. But yeah, when you see him on the edge of the box, we know that he has great technique that he can knock in a goal like that. Actually, it's all about the touch from Pekovic, the, the striker. The ball's played into him. He gets it away and uh, just keeps the move going. And then obviously that allows Modric to, to get a bit more space. But yeah, the, the thing is, Croatia now are the ones that have gone through as runners up. And, you know, what we have seen of Croatia the last couple of games, I mean, we knew going into the tournament, they weren't the team that, the same team that reached the, the World Cup final in 2018. But now they have a real chance of getting to a quarter final because they're gonna they've got the easier draw. Well, we don't know who they're gonna play yet, but they certainly have an easier draw compared to England. But Scotland just weren't good enough. Steve Clark said it after the game, they came up against a team that weren't good enough. But I wonder if he could go back to his team selection, would he have changed things? Maybe put McTominay into midfield, somebody that could get on on top of Modric and not give him the space. They just hadn't enough tactical flexibility for whatever reason. Uh, very un Steve Clark. I, I, it feels like in some ways, uh, you know. Um, but he kind of had decided pre tournament that's where McTomin McTominay was going to play and this was the style they were going to use. Yeah, obviously, with Tierney in there and Robertson, that's the, the strong point of their, their team. But definitely down the, the right hand side of Scotland's right hand side last night, Croatia had a lot of success down the, the left. It also obviously coincides with Perisic being one of Croatia's best players as well. So him playing on the left, he, he got a lot of joy out there. But um, yeah, it was it was disappointing because going into the second half, you know, you, the reset button had been pressed. The fact that, you know, it's all square. You've 45 minutes to give it everything, but they just couldn't get going because they couldn't get the ball. And it was a frustrating night. And look, we had a fair idea going into the game, Croatia were going to have a lot of possession, but it's what Scotland could do when they got the ball and, Obviously, the, the weak thing for Croatia was try and get the ball down the channels. And Scotland had a little bit of joy there, but they just didn't get enough enough of the ball. And when they did get it, at times, they were just, they weren't composed enough. And it was all a bit um, blood and thunder stuff, you know. Luka Modric is 36 in September. Uh, Wes Hulan still playing football at, at his level at 41. Like, no reason why Luka Modric still couldn't be strolling around, passing the ball, controlling games at a certain level or, or raising it for big games for another couple of seasons, right? Yeah, absolutely. Once you have the players around him. The problem with the Real Madrid midfield this season was it was the same the same guys the whole time. So if, you, if Real Madrid freshened things up and had a bit more energy in there, there is absolutely nothing to stop Luka Modric from playing on for... Uh, for Real Madrid for a few years where he can just control games and let the rest of the, the players around them do all the work. So have Croatia played themselves into contention? Uh, I mean, you know, who who is actually going to really want to play against Croatia at this point? Do you know what? As good as they were last night, I, I wouldn't have had much hope for them going into the tournament. I think up until last night, scoring goals was always going to be an issue for them. Uh, but maybe the, the three goals to give them a bit of confidence. But they're just that kind of team where they have a lot of possession. They don't probably do enough with it, but it's very hard to get the ball off them. Nil-nil and penalties is a, is a viable way to win the tournament from here, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it could happen, but certainly there, there'd be a lot of teams. The, the bigger teams certainly wouldn't fear playing Croatia. Uh, the, this evening's game, how how worried would Spain be about the scenario they find themselves in at the moment or is it also possible that we're about to see them explode into life in the tournament? Well, I think you're just going to get the same performance from Spain in terms of pass the ball around, hold on to it. If they score, they score. If they don't, there's a fair chance they go through even if they draw and if they get into the last 16, that, that's probably what's going to happen. That's the way they're playing at the moment. He, he doesn't look like he's going to change too much. Obviously, he's 
kept faith with Morata, who scored a goal at the weekend, even though I didn't think at the time he scored because the flag went up. But he obviously played Moreno as well. He misses a penalty. Yeah, Spain are they're not they're not the team that they used to be, but they still have some very good players. I, I think what's really killing them as well. Look, there's a few things, but that pitch is not helping them at all. In in Seville, it's not it's not even the best venue or the the best venue in Seville. But obviously, not all their games were meant to be played there because of COVID. Things have been changed around, but the pitch looks dreadful for a team that like to pass the ball. You want a pitch with a bit of fizz in it, and that just doesn't look great. Look, it's it's one of a few problems Spain have at the moment. But yeah, I I would put Spain in the same category as Croatia, where none of the big hitters are going to fear playing. Them. Uh, I mean, Slovakia have the like a really good chance of going through at the moment as things stand. Sweden are going to come out of that group. Is that your take? Sweden are going to beat Poland or draw with Poland to get through? Yes, Sweden are already guaranteed. So they're 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 just trying to top the group, which. You uh, yeah, that that's a tough enough one to call because Sweden have you know they haven't gained too many fans from this tournament because of the way they play, but it's effective. And uh, obviously, Isaac is their their star man, and yeah, the the four four two will probably get them through. And again, most teams would like to play Sweden. Um, they, they make it tricky for you, but they're not going to cause you too many problems on the at the other end of the pitch. So yeah, you're looking at uh, I mean. Irish fans would be looking at Slovakia thinking ah, mm. could have been us but mm. yeah they're um, yeah this this is this is one of the the groups that you want to face basically because um, this this is an easy enough group if you're if you're any of the other teams you want to be playing someone in this group so the other games tonight are group F obviously Germany, Hungary and Portugal against France very difficult to know exactly what's going to happen here and who wants what in terms of outcomes uh, who do you think ends up facing England? Well, France win, and then they they obviously top the group, and that would suggest then you're going to get Germany finishing second. We presume Germany have now turned the corner with that great performance that Yogi Love has just maybe decided in the first game against France. They're probably worried a bit too much about conceding, whereas once they conceded against Portugal, they just went for it. Maybe this is just the way to do it. Just go for it and stick with your three four three and then you would imagine they beat Hungary. That obviously gets them six points. That could be enough to top the group, depending on how France and Portugal go. The, there is talk in, in France that Deschamps is going to change his formation a little bit. He's going to go back to the 4-2-3-1 rather than the diamond formation. Pavard might be left out. Pavard, look, a lot of people would argue he shouldn't have played at the weekend, given the blow that he suffered in the first game. He also had a very poor game against Hungary. The goal came then his side. So the suggestion is he might be left out this evening. But you could see France just grinding out a, a win here and they top the group. And then you're left with probably Germany facing England, which would be an absolute cracker. And going back to the conversation yourself and Owen had a few minutes ago, maybe that's a game that Southgate reverts back to a three at the back. Do you think so? Well, just mirror what Germany are doing. With the aim of making sure that it's the tightest game of all time and ends up going to penalties. Yeah. I mean, surely that's the worst idea ever for England. Should they not just go and well, attack them? They could do, but if they if they play four, you saw what happened to Portugal at the weekend where Germany just kept getting two on one on the fullbacks and it was a very uncomfortable afternoon for Nelson Semedo. So um, if it was Kyle Walker in this in this instance, you, know, you, you, you need whoever's in front of you to help you out, which the way England have played, they've been quite conservative it would suggest that they would have a bit more protection. But mm. yeah, it's um, if you're England, obviously, I would think if you're England, you want to play Portugal. Yeah. Semedo versus Mbappe tonight, that could be uh, pretty, ah, it's pretty interesting. Frightening. Like, <laughs> like you got to feel for Nelson Semedo. He's thinking, oh, Gozens, that, that's a game that's behind me now. And then, yeah, it's going to be, a, it could be a very uncomfortable evening for Nelson what? Semedo once again. We were kind of thinking last week that, I mean, England can get away with being unspectacular in the group stages and then maybe do, say if it's Germany, do to Germany what France almost did in that second half, which was kill them on the counter-attack. But does that actually happen in reality? Because I guess the reason why that happened in that game is that France had a one the lead to protect and that's why Germany had all of the ball. Do, do Germany just try and sit back themselves and try and counter England on the attack? And as Gerard Lusa there, 
no matter what combination you, you look at in, in, in these group of death versus England games, you just get a really dour encounter instigated by England. Yeah, that's England are obviously Southgate knows that his defence is probably the weakest part of his team, so he's very concerned about that. So he's going to do all he can to protect it. And I think if if it was England Germany, I think Germany, as I said, I hope Yogi Love has worked out that they tried to play the the counter attack game against France at certain points, and it just weren't good enough for it. Um, so the best way for them is just to go all out attack and. Do you know what? If you if it doesn't work, at least you have a go. And you'd like to think England would adopt the same mentality and same attitude, but it doesn't appear that that's going to be the case. Who do you want to see most England play? Who do you want to watch England play the most? I want to see England Germany. I think England France wouldn't be a great game. Um, England Portugal like for England Portugal would be a clash of two of the best teams on paper, basically teams that like all Premier League all-stars almost and um, obviously there's, there's players outside the Premier League that play for, for both countries as well but England-Germany I think would be an exciting one I, I, despite what we've said about England I think the fact that Germany will probably go for it more would actually make it a really good game yeah. and obviously look there is the history there as well Alright Phil we've got to go anything else happening today? Uh, but th- those are the games there that you mentioned. Just um, I know you're going to be talking about Donegal. Some news from the Donegal camp. Michael Murphy and Jamie Brennan both expected to be fit for Sunday's championship opener against Down at Park Esther. And just something from the Olympics as well. Alcohol has been banned from Olympic venues in Tokyo. So the president of the Games says the decision has been made to remove any concern the public may have about the safety and security of the event. So the Olympics sounds like it's ticket that you don't want to cover as a, <laughs> as a journalist or to go to as a spectator the zero crack olympics uh, yeah. good, good stuff phil thanks a million for that cheers Hans. that's phil egan you can read his stuff today on otbsports.com you can hear him on today fm as well it's 7 57 this morning uh, if you want to get in touch we'd love to hear from you 087 180 is the whatsapp number of course you can leave a comment as i said earlier on the youtube stream shifty lad says good morning lads am i in a parallel universe England were poor and the Czechs had already qualified. Jar is stirring again. I'm, I'm not actually not. I think that like the way these tournaments work, we all know that actually at this point, almost nothing matters in terms of form and the group stages, right? Like you just had to qualify. You just had to get to this point and the tournament absolutely starts in this stage in the last 16 because some teams are just going to uh, bore their way to nil all draws and win on penalties who we didn't expect and there will be some bad team that reaches the quarterfinals and makes it easy for one of the good teams to get through to the semis. Uh, obviously, England have not got it easy in the round of the last 16, but are any of those teams... I mean, France, you would absolutely make favourites. Would Germany be favourites against England? They might be slight favourites, which in a way suits England. Yeah, 100%. But when, once England go in as underdogs in a game, I would give them a better chance as trying to uphold their end of the bargain, which is this home tournament and being favourites in every game. So so definitely, I think that it would suit... suit and. I think no matter what sort of way you look at it, whoever they get out of this group, I'd say that there is a case to be made for England in all three of those situations. Where, but is it a case to be made more on hunch rather than on recent form? That is kind of the concern I would have. Now, now the thing is, this has been so long telegraphed. The draw was done so long ago that Gareth Southgate probably has as much of a plan for those three teams as he does for, as he did for, say, Scotland, Croatia, Czech Republic. And You'd hope so, yeah. He, he knew that if you get over this last 16 game, then the coast is clear for England to get back to a major tournament final. Um, like I know they'll have to go on the road then in the quarterfinal, but like it, it, it will spell very good news for them if they manage to get over this last 16. And the good news for them is that they, they've, I guess, they've two players who weren't necessarily starters before last night and they ended up being two of their best players. Harry Maguire is back. That's also good news. But I, I would agree with Shifty Lads there when what he says that they have been average so far. But that, I, like, that's a different thing from maybe expecting a performance to come out of the blue. Now, then you can get into all the other elements here, which is the, maybe the performance anxiety that comes with playing in front of uh, a, a relatively busy Wembley where the pressure is, let's face it, greater than that Czech Republic game last night. The pressure last night existed, but it is nowhere near the pressure that's going to be there for the last 16. So that is a big factor that you throw into average performances so far. And for that reason, I would be worried about England.
Frank says, I never saw Croatia losing against Scotland simply because I never saw the at least two goals Scotland needed were ever going to come from. And Clark's teams just don't ever do attacking football. I think they will definitely have a lot of regrets because they just have enough quality in the team for them to be dangerous, particularly in that group, and it, it never emerged for them. Uh, will says, Sheehan telling Jer he lives in a FIFA world, harsh but fair. And ultimately very, very patronising. Patronising, yeah. Sorry about that. Pat patronising is usually your thing, not my thing. I can't believe that it's rubbed off on me to such a point where uh, I'm now doing the little, the little head taps. OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. We are going to take a quick break. We'll be back with the uh, papers and we're also going to be talking with Keith Wood very soon as well. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio Ireland's first and only sports radio station The Football Pod with Paddy and Andy our new weekly Gaelic football show with Paddy Andrews and Andy Moran I signed with the Rod Squad in 2011 that summer uh, Do you know what like, you hear I like, signed in the back of a smoke pack Roddy I, w I would say is like the Irish heavy metal We lost that championship game against Donegal we didn't lose a game for seven years after that I tell you we were angry after that game Dublin came back I remember in 2015 it was we're putting this right Download the old TV Sports app and subscribe to the GAA podcast feed now. Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna auto mower. Auto mower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawn mower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? Great. You can put the dinner on, so... Ah, no can do, love. I have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna Auto Mower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie. Why not check out the Boyle Sports betting app for a full range of markets on shots on target, assists, passes and more on every match of the Euros, all powered by Opta. Rated four and a half stars on the App Store, you'll find all our latest odds and offers for the Euros. So remind us where to go, CBG. Boyle Sports. This is betting. 18 plus bet responsibly. Gamblingcare.ie OTB AM With Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Two minutes past eight here on OTBM. If you want to get in touch with us, we'd love to hear from you. 087-9-180-180 is the WhatsApp number. A quick run through the newspaper headlines for you this morning. Hummels on LGBTQ rights. We need to talk about it in public. This is the uh, aftermath of the mayor of Munich asking if they could light the Allianz Arena in the pride flag. And UEFA have said no because it would be political, even though they'd actually asked to do it before uh, the recent decisions in Hungary um, and uh, Hummel's raising it and I guess in the context of what's going on in the NFL where we now have uh, our first openly gay player as well the, and he made the point in his video coming out that representation is important um, so you'd absolutely hope that somehow there's some talk of um, the Munich mayor finding a way around this and lighting the area around the uh, Munich arena this evening which would be hugely important if they can uh, manage to pull it off and it is obviously uh, Pride Month. I think the laces here this, um, is a campaign that Aviva have got behind as well. You can buy these laces in Intersport Elberys. And uh, we're certainly happy to um, to help highlight it because representation is important. It does really matter. And it is hugely important for uh, young people who are interested in sport to see that they are represented in the active playing population and not just the retired playing population because there's always that kind of, oh, I'm not sure if I would have been able to come out or if I would have been accepted. So the NFL are now ahead of almost all of the other sports in the world, which is a very unusual position when it comes to any social issue uh, at the moment. So we're still waiting for um, active players to come out in the male population in GAA and in the Premier League in particular. Uh, again, Thomas Hesselsberg, I think, is the most recent uh, example of somebody coming out after their career. So hopefully um, what's happened with Carl Nassib in the NFL is going to make it easier for people and hopefully this becomes far more normalised where people are just going about their day-to-day -day jobs in their teens and 20s and comfortable to be who they are as opposed to having to uh, keep that repressed because like, what does that say about the rest of us when people aren't happy to uh, be themselves? So uh, fingers crossed this helps. The, the Munich situation helps to raise awareness of the issue and Mats Hummel speaking about it is important and everybody else speaking about it is important too because uh, otherwise... You know, what are we doing here? If we can stick back up, otbsports.com, I'll run through the rest of the headlines on that one. So, uh, Chris Shields, love letter to Dundalk. The pubs 
and curry sauce. Lions coach Gatlin singles out Robbie Henshaw as world class. We'll talk about that with Keith Wood in just a moment. Fergie and Shearer were clapping me shouting, go on, Sonny. That's uh, the Sonny Pike story, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. And Chris Shields' departure there, obviously, confirmed yesterday in uh, the fact that he's joining Linfield. Very quickly, going to run through the papers today. There's a lot of match reports from last night. Darrow Shea's column in the Irish Times this morning. Old adage of one game at a time, never more relevant. Pictures of Clifford and uh, Michael Murphy there. Uh, adorning. So I haven't had a chance to dig into this just yet, but um, surely Kerry are going to... They're 12-point favourites, Owen. They're going to cakewalk for them on uh, Sunday in Clarny. They've definitely found it much easier... Saturday in Clarny, is it? To, Saturday, actually, yeah, to, to rack up a, a score against Clare when they're at home rather than being on the road. Cusick Park uh, has these... Uh, has this metal shed, and if Clare, in any code, get a big score against you, the locals tend to bang that metal shed with great ferocity, a ferocity that people from other uh, areas of the country just have never heard before. And without that metal shed and without that uh, ferocity, you'd imagine that uh, they could come close to covering that. But there will always be a sense of paranoia around a fixture like that because of the fact that it's been, what, two years since they won a championship game now. The London Times, it is, that's more like it. It's Raheem Sterling with his knee slide after scoring last night after a brilliant bit of work by uh, Jack Grealish. Uh, first English Lions wipe out for 71 years. Gotta love the, you gotta love the London Times, right? For the first time in 71 years, a British and uh, British and Lions side. We've just spotted this here, right? I mean, they've just completely, we've just been wiped from the map. <laughs> For the first time in 71 years, our British and Lions side will not contain a single Englishman. I'm not, I'm not misreading it. That's what the paper says. It's the second day in a row they've been at this stuff. I'll repeat it again. For the first time in 71 years, a British and Lions side will not contain a single Englishman after Warren Gatlin granted five Scotsmen the unique opportunity to represent the touring side at Murrayfield on Saturday against Japan. I, can, I didn't even think there was going to be an issue. I mean, like, there are loads of them just in the squad for the first time because of um, joining up late. Gatlin said that he considered the tour's curtain raiser against the 2019 World Cup quarterfinal to be a test match, although the Lions will not decide until later this year whether to award full international caps for their historic first fixture against Japan. Well, British and Lions side. We wait with bated breath for that decision, no matter or not it's a, it's a full international, but also it's a send-off for all the Scottish players, right? That's, that's why they've all been uh, started in the, the, those head-to-heads against those English players, which I'm not sure how many there were, considering all the English players aren't fully up to, to speed just yet anyway. So uh, is, does that mean that like the, the British Lions go out with eight players? Is that it? Like, is, is yeah, that what the Lions no, are not. expecting? Well... Anyway, uh, <laughs> let's not go there. The Irish Daily Mail this morning. We've no fear. England claim group to retain home comforts and boost for Donegal with Murphy set to return. It's up for grabs now. The mirror leaning back into the uh, the history, obviously, uh, 1966 and all that. Uh, uh, now for one of the big guns at home on Tuesday is Grealish, Saka and Sterling give England the top spot. And uh, they've obviously got their GA previews coming as well. Check in. Um... Do you think it's named after the pub in Dublin, or is it like a... I would, I would be surprised if it wasn't, to be honest. I would say that it's definitely it. Uh, England book last 16 clash at Wembley, and check out Tartan Army's Chrono. That's Chrono? Because Croatia said no to them. Uh, and there, there's the knee slide done again. Job done now for the hard part. That's Raheem Sterling celebrating. And Sterling's record of scoring goals for Gareth Southgate is extraordinary. Uh, the Irish Independent back page. FAI to call on government for investment in League of Ireland academies. Gatlin backs world-class Aki and Henshaw. And hockey heroine McFerrin's appeal after her World Cup medal is stolen. Aisha McFerrin living in Utrecht playing hockey at the moment. Had a break-in at her apartment and loads of stuff got nicked, including the silver medal from the uh, World Cup. Please help. Some coward decided to break into my apartment and steal mine and my roommate's belongings. Among them was my 2018 World Cup medal, which is more valuable than all the electronics. I would appreciate any help from the hockey world and Utrecht family in finding my medal. So um, I presume it's not actually worth that much to the person who stole it. It's really just the fact that um, you can't really get another one. Uh, Heads up, Sterling seals Wembley return and heads down. Modric sends Scotland out. That is the back page of the Guardian and then the uh, the hurdled... um, Sterling the England hero is the back page on that one. So, right, it is 10 minutes past, nine minutes past eight this morning here on OTBM. And I'm delighted to say Keith Wood is with us of the uh, British and Irish Lions. Keith, good morning to you. How are you? Sure, I'm great, thank you. Listen, I'm going to have to listen to you read the roundup of the papers more often. The incredulous reading of the headlines is worth the the listening alone. Um, Some of the headlines are funny. I was reminded from 
the um, <clears throat> the British Lions thing. And Louis Late, who was the head of South African rugby in 1997, kept uh, on his opening speech when we first met up with a function. He called us the English team for <laughs> most of his speech um, and uh, never deigned to call us Irish at any stage. It was the English team or the British team. So we shouted him down about five or six times, but uh, it didn't seem to sink in. Does, does that change over time, Keith, the, the need to, to shout those people down? No, uh, I don't think I, I don't think okay, it ever takes... a requirement. I mean, like, the, no, I'm not talking about the, 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 necess the necessity of it. I'm yeah, talking. Absolutely. Um, uh, it's no, it, it, look, very few people view it in, in that fashion. I think uh, for an awful lot of the, the, the Lions history was um, it was very Wales uh, focused, partly, from, you know, when, the, when you think of the big Lions tours back in the in the 60s and 70s were huge numbers of Welsh players. Um, but no, it was, uh, it used to be originally called the British Isles Touring Team, which is a more geographical than political uh, view. But um, no, I think it's worth reminding um, people if they get it wrong, exactly why they've got it wrong, because it's, it's to be honest, it's disrespectful. Yeah, and, and uh, look, I'm presuming it's just a typo. Somebody somebody deleted a word on the, it's, just, it's funny that it was that word that was uh, deleted. It's, it's funny that that word might get dropped frequently and, and it's dropped in the London Times this morning as well which are look and also that they're having a bit of a hissy fit about the fact that there's no English players in the team for the first time in 71 years which presumably does not matter a jot this is a bunch of the English players joined up late and so therefore I guess they're being rested or eased into action well I look for it's for me I get equally annoyed when I hear people calling about Irish Lions because that isn't what it is it's it's the grouping of four different countries together, and it doesn't matter about um, what the setup is. Look, there was a practicality reason here. The guys have been playing elsewhere and haven't been allowed to be freed up. So you can imagine it's the, the players who've been playing for the last couple of weeks are the ones who are going to get the, the first chance to play. Is Gatlin just being also a little bit provocative? Is there an element of that? Because he does like to stir things a little bit. Well, that would be his form. You know, I think he likes it. And, um, uh, and look... Uh, but again, for the same time, do you want to turn up on a Tuesday and play, you know, when you have other guys been playing for a period of time? So, look, I, it's funny. I was trying to think back to uh, the huge sense of trepidation of wanting to get the jersey on and playing. And even uh, on my second tour and having played, you think that would be lessened. And it wasn't. I couldn't wait to play. Um, I captained the first match of the tour in, in 2001 I was never as nervous in my whole life as I was in that game. For some reason, I was, it was the fear of of not delivering and of making, um, you know, of letting the jersey down at the start. I couldn't get over. I was so nervous. I've seen a picture of me running out onto the field and I'm breaking it. And we played Western Australia. We beat them by 116 points. I had no reason to be nervous, and it wasn't it wasn't that we weren't going to win. It was that we we weren't going to start it right and there is a big element in terms of momentum to this not just for individuals but also for the team and you want to be able to get off to a very good start if you can why were you nervous though because you, you captained your country this is your second lions tour you're a seasoned international at that stage what what looking back now what was it about the responsibility that just put you on edge a little bit um it's uh... You could cock up on the first week at the tour and maybe struggle to get back in and get a chance there because uh, you know you've heard every comment that's been said this week um, or the last few weeks about everybody's going to get a chance and um, not every chance is equal that's the other point so you don't want to make mistakes at all it can be a very limiting factor actually if the fear uh, puts you under pressure. So I had nerves beforehand because I understood the magnitude of it and you want to get a sense of momentum and you want to deliver right for the jersey. You want to deliver right for yourself too. And I want you want to put yourself in a good position to get picked for the test team. And it's you're not going to do that on the first day, um, um, but you can ruin it on the first day. And um, you can suddenly say, God, he's not, he's not up for it. So it just... It's because it only comes around every four years because it's such a limited chance. It's why it's a great, 
you know, it's, it's such a great thing, but it also has all the pressure that sits with it. And like there's players that have been very, very good and they have never shown for the lines. And, you know, it's, you just don't ever want to have that situation to happen. But even psychologically, you know, and I haven't touched on this before, there was days when I was so nervous before games and played really well. And there was days I was nervous and played really badly. I could never quite figure out what it was. Um, we talked a couple of weeks ago about um, uh, Neil Jenkins uh, puking in the change room. I was one of those guys too. And there was times when I would do that and go out and play, it could be man of the match or I could be rubbish. I never knew. So it, for me, it was very frustrating to not have an understanding of myself and my own psychology as to whether I was going to perform well that day. It, things have obviously changed significantly in that if you were an academy <laughs> player now at Munster or Leinster or wherever you were coming through, there would be access to sports psychologists who would give you the tools to understand that a bit more. Would that have changed anything, do you think, in, in retrospect, if you had had access to that type of training, essentially? Uh, there was there was bits of training back in in those days, and we um, and I was permanently looking for a psychologist to work with Ireland at, at uh, in the late nineties because we were, um, you know, we weren't we weren't at the standard that we wanted to be, and I felt it was something that was missing. Um, I think there is an understanding of it, but there also is the reality that you still have to go out and perform, and that's the one governing thought. Um, uh, for me, I think you understand an awful lot over a period of time. It's part coach as well. If the coach can understand that, you know, you can make mistakes and still have an excellent performance at the end of the match. Um, I've seen some coaches that take players off early because they think they've lost it. And you should do that with some players because they can't get it back. You can see that they're emotionally all over the place. But actually some guys, some of the really top players, you can see them make two or three mistakes and then do one good thing and suddenly put in an incredible 60 or 70 minutes of a performance. So, look, I, I, I think psychology is incredibly important anyway. I think it's it's essential for the Lions because they don't have a huge amount of time together. So it's one of the, the, the core elements is to get that sense of belief that you can trust the players around you, that they are going to have your back if you make a mistake. Um, and that becomes very important. Just the, the, the uh, team itself we'll talk about in a moment, but the last thing that I um, kind of wanted to ask about is the, the quality of rugby that you play when you, you end up being training with the Lions for the first time and uh, meeting up with the squad and just realising that every single player here is the best in their position that maybe you'll ever play with. Is it significantly noticeable early, before you play the matches, just how good the environment is? Um, it's... You see it in the first training session, um, the lines that people run, the depth that people keep. I mean, depth sounds like a very kind of average thing to, to talk about in terms of rugby. But if you have um, if you have depth, you can react to everything. You don't even need to hear a call. You're going to be able to see it. Um, a lot of people are rushing to make decisions, but the really, really good players, um, they make their decisions incredibly late. So they can do that when they're, you know, on a sense of, you know, in, in a line of depth where they can read what's happening in front of them. Um, but you also then see the qualities of what players have, what makes them very good. And, and, and it's different when you're playing against them because you're looking to try and stop them. But when you're playing with them, you're trying to emulate the things that they do. You're trying to understand how that can push your game a little bit further. So you have scrum halves that push a pass in a different fashion um, that force you to run onto the ball in a particular way. Um, you have out halves that, um, uh, you know, again, see things incredibly differently. Um, you have front row forwards that scrummage in a better way or a slightly different way, have a slightly different bind that suddenly puts you into a better position. Uh, these are all guys at the top of the game. Um, and it's funny, I've been struck by the last three or four weeks because we, we know that we're part of it, but we you can over-talk the lines so much. Um, but if you listen to any of the players that are talking about it, and the cynics among us will say that they get paid a lot of money and that's all great and fine, but it's the top of the tree in terms of performance for players on these islands. And they all want to go. They all want to see what's what it's all about, but they all want to experience it. And it's a hard, hard place because... 
it's such a short tour. So you don't get a run in for a couple of years to understand what this is like. You could be in and out of it in six weeks and you've either done well or you haven't. Um, it's a tough place to be, but it's the most exciting place to be. The team itself then, obviously, um, you talked about the importance of momentum. Uh, these pre-tour matches, it's always very difficult to know exactly how much to read into them. The fact that there is still the, the Premiership final on and so players will, will be joining up after that game, which I think is happening on the same day as this test. So obviously, this isn't the test team. We, we know it's not the test team. But if you play well in this game, before you go... If you have it in the coaches' heads on that long trip down to South Africa that that was, that was pretty good, Jack Conan was great, better than we expected, or whoever, it's an opportunity that you just don't want to blow. Yeah, I, look, I'm not a fan of of, of a, a test match and they, they're uncertain as to whether to call it a test match or not, but I'm uncertain. I, well, I don't like them before the tour. Um, I think uh, a Lions tour is about the um, moulding of groups of players together. And I think that's, the, the, it's a touring side. That is what it is. I understand the um, the practicalities of why it's happening, um, but uh, it's hard, not hard to, to get excited because actually, strangely this week, I've got really excited by it. Um, so much and all as I've, I've had reservations, I've been, I've been looking forward to this, looking forward to seeing how different players and different combinations can go. But also these guys have been together for a couple of weeks now. Um, they have what they'd have worked for this one, you know, so it's a very fairly focused team to this game. But um, I think you can put down a marker. I think the I, look, I think you want to be playing in a big stadium. You want to be putting that jersey on that makes that just makes a huge difference. It just, well, for me, it brings a level of excitement. But I, look, I think the guys want to play well. They don't want to get injured. Um, they also don't want to lose and they want to have a proper performance on the field. And I don't know that you can see a huge amount of style in the in the game. I think it becomes, again, very simplistically, but done but done incredibly well. And there might be a bit of a change where you're looking to move the ball around but if you're ever to pick a team that is entirely the opposite of what you're going to play against on tour, it would be Japan. Japan will be ev everywhere at once, running everything at every time. The ball will never be dead. They have no, they have a couple of big guys, but they're not a big heavy hitting side. It is the exact opposite of, of what they're going to face for the next uh, um, six weeks. So I think it's a really intriguing game and it's one where we could struggle quite heavily because um, Japan are incredibly capable, but they're capable in a style that we're not really used to. One of the big talking points from an Irish perspective, Keith, is going to be the <laughs> fact that Henshaw and Aki have the midfield jerseys. Is your sense that it's theirs to keep come test time? No, I, I, don't, I don't consider that for, for anybody that's playing. I do like the idea of combinations that these guys have played together before. Um, but I don't think you can say that anything is is there to be to be kept. Um, uh, you'll find out in about a month um, or maybe less that um, I'm sure it has to be a month, but that certain players will come to the top. But whether you'd say for absolute certain that anybody is nailed on, I don't believe that. I think Gatland is guys he knows and likes, and he'll want to play them. And I think uh, I think Henshaw is one of those. Um, I think Aki was a surprise in getting selected. He gets a great opportunity to go and do it. Um, but no, I wouldn't. I don't read anything into this at the start. I, th I don't read anything into the first three games. Actually, it's you read into the performance of the players that come out of it, as opposed to the selection before it. From the perspective of Aki, right, getting named, obviously Gatland has in his head he wants that type of player. And look, I don't know. Maybe he wants that type of player for the two midweek games and the warm-up games. But, I, uh, do you know, like Gatland has a very specific idea in his head of how he wants the game to be played. And Bundy Aki might be the perfect prototype for a Gatland player. Uh, I, I agree. Uh, that's, uh, like, I think we were surprised he got picked. Um, but when you look at it, it makes sense in terms of, of Gatland's style. He likes to have big carrying centres. Uh, he likes to have a bit of spark too. Um, I, like he could fit in. And look, I think if you were to, if you were to wind the clock back 
I think he would have been happy, happier to have Manu Tuilagi fitter and playing sooner. And that would have been it. But Aki gets the chance on it. So, look, I'd go back... Um, Go back to 2001, which is a long time back, and Rob Henderson uh, not having an inkling of a chance until he got the chance, and then he didn't give it up. And so he came very late to 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 being um, a runner for that test team, but he played in the three tests. And he played bloody well. He played, he played fantastically well. Um, uh, Hendo was a great tourist. Um, but didn't, I think, kind of got through the whole tour without any pressure being on him. And then the second that the pressure did come on, his reaction to that was extraordinary. I mean, in the first test, I thought he was, I thought he was incredible. He had an incredible game. Draco got most applauded for that game, but, uh, but Hendo was incredible beside him. So do we maybe underrate Bondiaki in, in, like, as a country a little bit? Uh... Is there is there a possibility that a player like that goes off and has a Lions tour and comes back and we're like, oh, we should have had you um, in the team as a nailed on and we should be finding some way to to get Gary Ringrose in the team or maybe Gary Ringrose is that bench player now for the next 18 months as, on the back of what happens on the Lions tour? Well, it depends on how you're going to play. And I think if we're, um, if we're looking at how Joe Schmidt wanted um, his centres to play... He played Aki at different times, but it, it, for the most part, he wanted um, very consistent play that happened time and time after uh, with, with very little risk taken. Aki did that for him for a while. I think when you see um, uh, Farrell coming in, he's not quite as much as that. He wants a little bit more, uh, more handling uh, required. It all depends entirely on the coach or what the coach wants. So the lines is very different. It doesn't take into consideration your it takes your form to get you onto the plane provided the coach thinks that that fits into how he thinks the lines are going to play i think that's that's a fair call but um you then have to say when you come home actually if aki does a particular job we know he can play in that style is that something that we can incorporate into an irish backline that's becomes the question i don't think he's been under i think he's done very well um, since since he's come over, I think he's ingratiated himself incredibly well in in Connacht. Uh, they they love him over there for for what he's delivered and given to the province. I also think he's played very well for Ireland. I do think he struggles a little bit with tackle technique, and he still is standing up tackling a little bit too high. There's a high risk in that. You can't afford that in a Lions tour. You can't afford to get sent off. You mm. could be gone for for a huge amount. Yeah, there's there's talk that this week he's been. Flying into people in training, like you just haven't seen the the, the exact technique and, and how he's been flying into people in training, but I'm, I'm sure sure it's all good. Just a couple of quick ones before we let you go, Keith. Uh, Connor Murray, after the the season he's had, and from what you've seen all season, how high are your hopes for him this summer? Um, my look, he is a, he is a seasoned line. Um, he, I think, it took him an awful lot longer to get back from the injury. Um, but he is, he is a world-class player. He just wasn't for a while. But I think he started to come back into to form. I want to see him playing the way he can play, which is interesting back rows, which, is, uh, which means he's going to get hit a fair bit. But that's part of it. Um, but if he does that, he, he opens up more space for people at the back. Look, I find South Africa really interesting um, team because they're so big but also because of the manner in which their two smallest players play in the Cheslin Colby can open up anything but Fafta Clerk's defensive setup for um for South Africa is amazing for for a small guy he's allowed to do what he wants so he can go back deep and pick up ahead of pace um, be on side, break through the line and go out and make a tackle on his own. He's not part of the defensive lineup. He's allowed to run as a rogue defender. Um, that puts guys under pressure an awful lot. I'd be interested to see what the Lions do with that. That's where Connor becomes incredibly important because if he passes every ball, um, players can be picked off in the back line. But if he interests the back row, um, that becomes much harder to do. And then just finally on 
that back row which has got more than a, a hint of Irish about it with uh, Ty Byrne and Jack Conan in there. Is, is this the, the, the beginning of an evolution for, for Byrne to be a, a back row full stop? I know, I, I think probably he's played more at second row all season this season, but is this just a, a lines fix or, or, or almost a, a career change in a, in a slight way for him over the next little while? Well, I think it's an interesting comment from Gatlin that he, he considers him um, a back row forward. Um, I have to say, I probably do as well. I think uh, I think he lacks the ballast for for second row, and he definitely does against South Africa, and at times when he's played in the second row um, against big heavy hitting teams, he he a lot of his energy has been taken out of it, you know. And I think you lose some of his skills. He is extraordinary at breakdown, but if he's spending all his life uh, scrummaging against uh, huge men. Um, you don't quite have the gas to get around into the places that you'd like to be. So, look, I think it's a really good place for him. It'll be interesting to see how he performs because it's the most competitive part of the Lions back row, is the Lions back row. I, I know we're not going to read too much into it, but uh, you don't want to start the tour with a defeat, particularly in a home match. When I know you're not supposed to be at home either, but there's, a, I, there's not jeopardy around the game because obviously they could lose this and win a test series. But you definitely don't want to lose your own first game. It's 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 not a it's not an uh, it's not a game against the Babas here where nobody really takes the result too seriously. If Japan beat the Lions well at the weekend, it'll be a bit of a stake around. Well, there's a couple of things on that. One is I think it's fantastic that they're playing Japan. Um, I wish it was away from home. Um, and I do think we need to see what the Lions can do in terms of some of the other countries, be it Argentina, Japan in particular, maybe the Pacific Islands as part of a tour, if that was able to happen at some stage, would be really interesting because, you know, we, it's a great way to, to, to grow the game. I mean, the Lions is an incredibly large and central part of rugby. Um, even though some fans don't think it is, rugby players themselves think it is um they want to take the scalp so is there jeopardy i actually think there is jeopardy in it um for for the simple reason this is going to be a different tour to any other um the players are going to be in a bubble for nearly the whole tour they're not going to be out they're going to be in in their hotel room a huge amount um you want as many wins as you can you want to have a feeling that things are good um because it could be tough, tough going if you lose a couple of matches that you should win, and you uh, like you, you still you, you've no opportunity to go outside your hotel, you know. So um, I think it's a very, very difficult tour ahead for for um, uh, for all the players and the and the management. It's just trying to get the wins so that they can enjoy themselves because a winning tour is what's great. Now the only thing anybody will care about at the end is if they win the series. But you'd still like to have a little bit of joy for the, the the first month of the tour. Yeah, and it's more likely to be joyful and more likely that they'll all bond if they're winning and their you know training is less tense and people are a bit more honest. I made that mistake at that point and yet we still win the game. I'm more happy to have that mistake highlighted. If we lose, it's suddenly I'm scapegoated as a result of it and you know the factions start a little bit easier. So look, I'm, I'm not saying that... Uh, it's a must-win game, but, you know, nobody likes, particularly these guys, they don't like losing. No, they don't like losing. Um, uh, I thought it was very interesting at the, at the weekend, the last two weekends, watching the Saracens guys. I think Saracens have been... They started in the championship very, very poorly, um, and some of their wins have been hard fought. But the second they came to something that mattered, which was the playoff games at the end, they won 60 nil in the first one and 57-15 in the second one. Um, they're guys that are fresh and eager. You have everybody else who are in cup finals or all at the end of the season are all doing very well. And for a lot of these players, it'll be their last Lions tour. And for some of them, it'll be their first and they want to have more. Um, it makes for, you know, these are alpha you know, um, uh, players, you know, they're at the absolute top of their game. They don't ever want to lose. So I think I think a one-off test type game is incredibly tough for the Lions because of the history of it, but also because you don't ever want to cock up. 
Keith, good stuff. Looking forward to it. Thanks a million. Cheers. Cheers, gents. Just a reminder, of course, that we're very excited to let you know that OTB Sports will be broadcasting full live commentary of all nine matches from the British and Irish Lions tour of South Africa and, of course, the game at Murrayfield. Brian O'Driscoll and Alan Quinn are going to be alongside Neil Tracy on commentary for the three test matches. Devin Toner, Neve Briggs and Jack Carty among the co-coms for the warm-up games. We'll have analysis and reaction from Keith Wood and Ron Nagar across the uh, duration of the competition as well. It all starts this Saturday against Japan. Andy Dunn is going to be alongside Neil in the commentary box from the three o'clock kickoff, which will be live on Off the Ball on News Talk. And our coverage will be brought to you in association with Vodafone, lead partner of the British and Irish Lions. I'm pretty excited about this. Yeah, it's a brilliant day of sport on Saturday. It's going to be a brilliant summer, uh, like throughout. And I guess, what is it, the week after that, then they're up against the Bulls, is sort of sorry, against the, the Lions. Um, I think it's their first game in South Africa, isn't it? Just a, just a week later. So it's like a pretty quick turnaround. And even if they get over Japan on Saturday, it's kind of like the travelling and the, the acclimatisation and, and all of that. The following week then, which will be an interesting thing. And these are the things that they, it is like an, an, an organism in itself, isn't it? The, the Lions tour is where yeah. this thing kind of like takes on a life of its own after a couple of weeks. The South African tours are also the best tours in terms of being able to watch them and listen to them yeah. in our time zone. So the uh, five o'clock kickoffs on Saturday over the course of the um, entire tour. And then there's two midweek games which are kicking off at seven o'clock. We'll have those live for you on Off the Ball on Newstalk as well. But those five o'clock on a Saturday evening is the perfect time for whatever it is that you want to do with your life. I, it was, um, it, was it three o'clock in 09? Or, or am I making that up? It feels that five o'clock is, is a little bit later, which is obviously great because those Saturday morning Lions tests are like I mean the New no, Zealand ones are like ugh. nobody wants a Saturday morning Lions test if uh, you're too bleary eyed uh, there's also I think from an Irish rugby fans perspective a little bit of PTSD about getting up to watch games in New Zealand where oh it's 60 nil. look at that mm. or oh look we're doing really well we're going to win this game it's like ah no I'm sorry you are not going to win this game it depends how uh what will you look at your glass, I guess? For me, it's getting up early in 2011 and seeing them beat Australia in the, the World Cup. So, I mean, I've, I've managed to airbrush all those hammerings of New Zealand out of my memory. 36 minutes past eight here this morning. If you want to get in touch with us, we'd love to hear from you. 087 180 180 is the WhatsApp number. A reminder, OTBAM brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. Um, I do want to talk to you a bit about this. Uh, former Olympian and now Team Ireland performance and psychologist for Tokyo Olympics, uh, Jesse Barr, spoke with Joe last night ahead of the Games next month. Here's part of that chat. You can find the full podcast on the OTB Sports app or in the OTB Highlight stream wherever you get your pods. Yeah, and it would be a big part of what I, uh, you know, a big part of conversations I have with athletes is around confidence. And I'll often ask them, and I say some of them are sick of me hearing, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how confident are you about this performance or this event coming up? Mm. We'll explore, explore why they gave a certain number. You know, okay, you gave a seven. Why wasn't an eight? Okay, you gave it a seven. It wasn't a six. Where's your confidence coming from? You know, and... We try to explore what we would call like your stable sources of confidence. You know, where are you getting your confidence that is not shakeable? So, you know, your training that you're putting in every day, that the kind of, like you mentioned the word, Joe, that evidence. Where is the evidence that you can be confident? You're working hard. You haven't skipped a training session. Okay, nothing, maybe there's no, been no massive tra training session that stands out, but it's consistent. You know, and sometimes it's just digging deeper to see where those sources of confidence are. And that was a big thing, I think, after COVID was because there wasn't that evidence. So people were coming in, to, coming into their first competitions with very little kind of evidence of, you know, previous previous competitions, previous performances to kind of base their what, where they're at. So the confidence had to come back to the day-to-day -day work they were doing. You know, where how how were they looking after their recovery, their nutrition? Can they take confidence in their in the process rather than worrying about what the outcome is going to look like? And a lot of the confidence issues tend to come from thinking too much about what the outcome is going to be, you know, and I don't feel confident that I can run this or achieve this. And actually it's like, well, can you do the steps up until that and focus on those controllables? And um, so, yeah, like, like I said, evidence is a big part of it, you know, rather than saying, well, I'm confident because I know I can go in and beat this team and say, okay, well, if you play, play another team, does that mean you've no confidence? You know, you want those stable sources. So, Someone's just digging deeper and seeing, well, yeah. where's the confidence? Why can't I be confident? That's uh, Jesse Barr, the uh, Ireland uh, sport and 
performance psychologist um, who will be part of the Olympic Games crew. Um, I, I know at one stage as well, uh, there was a, a bunch of other people who were involved with the other teams who were due to go. I think COVID might have scuppered the uh, the wider travelling party, which for some of the sports is is probably upsetting their um, preparations a little bit. Uh, but really interesting stuff there from Jesse Barr. You can get that full podcast if you get onto the OTB Sports app and subscribe to our highlights feed. You'll get good stuff like that and all of our Olympics build up will be in the highlights feed and everything that we're doing across that as well. So if you want to catch up on any of the Olympians or the Paralympians who are preparing for uh, the Olympic Games in Tokyo and they're like really, really close now. You know, when we were talking to Greg O'Shea yesterday about the Sevens tournament, it is essentially four weeks and three days away from uh, getting underway in Tokyo. So as I said, we're counting down in days now at this point rather than months. It, we've obviously been waiting for it for a very, very long time and it looks like uh, it's got the go-ahead locally as well. So, uh, fingers crossed, we'll all have plenty of sport to look forward to over the next couple of months. A reminder, OTBAM brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. Uh, a couple of comments coming in. Rice and Phillips are only the Lampard and Gerrard of 2021 and fewing the managers back in the day quite simply didn't have the bottle to play only Lampard or Gerrard and Southgate is doing the same now, says Frank. Who I think is completely wrong, by the way. Like, what what England didn't have was a good manager who could fit all those players into the same team. I don't know if you've been ever been sat down and been sucked into those 100 goals uh, montages on Sky where they talk with the player about the 100 Premier League goals that they had, but Paul Scholes spoke about playing on the left when Giggs was out injured and how he really enjoyed playing on the left in midfield and it really suited him and he scored loads of goals. Like There was a couple of games where he scored, there was one game where he scored a hat-trick from the left wing, but his manager at that stage was Alex Ferguson who could say to him this is what we're going to do you're going to play on the left and this is your role and that's what you're going to have to do for the team for us to benefit from it but whatever happened with England at that point they couldn't find a way to do that nobody could tell Gerard or Lampard how to play together but they were both smart clever footballers who could easily have played together yeah like that's like I think that had to have been the case I, I don't, I'm not sure would it have necessarily been a better situation for for one of them to have been dropped and for the other one to be the sole like midfielder who can shoot well from outside the box like th- they were different players and they fulfilled I, I guess slightly different roles for their clubs which maybe seems a bit more obvious now that I think in maybe the Southgate team they both probably coexist quite well like I'm not sure Phillips and Rice playing together is is it's an completely, issue. it's completely different, by the way. It's yeah, like, they're also not the two totemic figures of the team. You can absolutely drop both of them, one of them, whatever way. Like, I mean, if you're like, if we're talking about the politics of yeah. maybe Lampard and Gerrard, like, I mean, they're on a whole level above Rice and Phillips. Just even just when it comes to the profile, and I think Sven, Sven Goran Eriksson would have very much been aware of what a big decision like that could have had in the team, um, or w- what impact it would have had. So yeah, like I'm not, I'm not sure is it necessarily the Rice and Phillips is the same as the Lampard and Gerrard, but to your point about whether or not the Lampard and Gerrard thing uh, could have worked, I guess it could have, and there were there were so many other parts of that England team that was that was messed up around would that. Would Yogi Love have found a way to put them both in the team and, and play? Would would Luis Enrique have found a way? Yeah. Would Pep Guardiola have found a way to put those? Yes. Like most, most quality international managers would have found a way to make that work. Uh, Pep Guardiola would have overthought it and not uh, would have found a way to not put them in, in the same team together but I, I take your point for sure and I think that it, like, it, it's very hard to, to make a case that they would have been better off without one of them when they were just both very very gifted players Like I think sometimes what we forget is that like these footballers are exceptional at doing almost every role. Of course they will be more exceptional at doing some roles compared to the other, but they're generally exceptional at everything they do. Now, I'm not talking about playing right back or in goals. Steven Jarrett like could have played right back and probably did, did a couple of games when he break into the team and was absolutely amazing. Would we'll be better than than most uh, right backs in the world. Maybe not at the top tier, but in the world. Like, I mean, you see my point here that there, there could have been some sort of shift where they would have still been able to be on the same pitch and yeah. still would have been class. Like, you look at Pakaya Saka last night, for example. I mean, he's a left back who's been transformed into a right winger over the course of a few months. Uh, at Arsenal and all of a sudden he looks like somebody who is capable of having a real impact in the knockout stages of the European Championships as a right winger like that that is like that's not even that 
dramatic really it's kind of like okay young professional footballer ready to be molded takes his talents to a new area of the football pitch and and, and away you go and I think that might have happened if, if like maybe a little bit better with 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 Lampard and Gerrard the, the problem was the preparation and maybe not building into a tournament trying to think about the tournament scenario about what happens when you come up against good teams that aren't the cannon fodder that England play in, in the qualifications which maybe was was always an issue for that England team yeah, and I think the quality of coaching, like, and the, you know, who was giving Sven the ideas? What was the what was the uh, the marketplace of ideas that when he went in after training and sat down and, and you know, I mean, who was advising Sven? What what was Sven interested in at that stage of his <laughs> career? What were the who what were the great minds he was surrounding himself with? <laughs> Yeah, uh, like I mean, there's. Yeah. I I would watch the I would watch the hell out of a six part Netflix this Sven years and like a deep dive into all that stuff. I would I would absolutely watch the the failure of the team that had Beckham, Lampard, Gerrard, Scholes, and a glittering array of strikers at various stages to actually do anything. Yeah. Like the night from 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 ninety eight on, right? From from Beckham getting sent off. All the way to like, I don't know. When did they stop being interesting? Yeah, before, before Big Sam, just before Big Sam arrives. Like so, yeah. So it's uh, Kane taking corners, Iceland. Uh, uh, Steve McLaren. Ah, uh, give, give it to me. Hook it to my veins. That, that's the that that's the end of, and then Southgate comes in and and makes things quite placid and. Uh, very nice, and that's no bad thing if you're an English fan. But to the rest of us, to the baying mob outside of uh, outside of England, uh, it's it's not great news. The thing, though, here's the thing about all that, is that the English will absolutely make that happen. They they will absolutely create this catalogue of incredible content about the chaos years. Once the chaos years are over, are over. and yeah. once they have a trophy, it's kind of like Dubs. They've they've embraced what happened in the 2000s. Yeah, ha ha ha! Wasn't that funny when we were like completely blowing our opportunity, even though we had a great team? Uh, Genie for the Netherlands has been immense. Liverpool will regret letting him go, says Andrew. I don't know how much he's getting at uh, Paris Saint Germain, but it could be half a million a week. And like as good and all as he's been for the Netherlands, he didn't and doesn't play the same role for. Uh, maybe he's going to play that role. For, there you go. For PSG. He didn't play the same role for for. Liverpool, well, there you go, go on. Well, like, well, is that not just perfect evidence of the lampard Gerard thing, rather than copying and pasting the player that they were for the club or trying to shoehorn them into a specific role? You can do different role. things at international if level. Aldum is showing that you can be a Champions League winner in one element of a midfielder and a potential uh, star or, or on the team of the European Championships in a slightly different midfield position. It's a it's a broad scope of things, the idea of being a central midfielder, and Lampard and Gerard probably would have been able to tick a lot of those boxes. All right, John Duggan is on hold. John, good morning to you, how are you? Sure, no one will be well. What's going on? What's your take on, uh, on how things are evolving at the moment? Um, I think that Saka was brilliant last night and Grealish. I think they all have to play Grealish, Sterling and Saka against uh, Germany or France or Portugal in the last 16. Harry Kane was a bit better last night, but as David Coleman said, goals pay the rent. And I'd like to see Harry Kane score some goals for England. And... Um, Look, if they're going to win the thing, they have to be one of the big uh, elite teams, and, and that's what they're probably going to face. If France and Portugal draw and Germany win, they, they could be facing France in the last 16. Um, if they play Germany, are they going to have to change their system to counteract the German wing-backs, which, who were you so effective against Portugal? These are the kind of things I'm thinking about at the moment, but uh, didn't concede a goal in the group stage. It was a 7 out of 10 group stage, I would have said, for England. And you don't want to pick too soon, right? You don't. You, well, the tournament starts now. It's all about. It's hard not to get to the last 16 of the Euros. And you've got four games to win it. In the World Cup, you've got seven games to win it. And England now have their big test next Tuesday. I don't think Mount and Chilwell will be involved. Foden, they didn't want to risk last night because of a second yellow. Um, but hard for him to get back in the team. Yeah, I think you have to play Grealish and you have to play Saka on what we saw last night. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Like taking somebody out for fear of the second yellow. Like, was that an excuse to try and see if somebody else was going to light a spark, or was that actually this guy's far too important to us if we're going to win this thing? Well, he plays a certain way under Guardiola, and I think I don't know if he has been effective as effective under Southgate so far. Um, they have an embarrassment of riches. Southgate now is the, the, this is where he is to earn his corn because uh, he has to make the right calls with personnel 
and the system for the game against uh, Germany, Portugal or France. I think the back four, I think Maguire being back last night was actually a help. I think Shaw played better with him beside him. Uh, but it's going to be absolutely fascinating to see what he does with the attacking positions. Kane is going to start, we know that. But Kane could do it scoring some goals. Um, 23 goals in the Premier League, 14 assists. I, for me, he's still too deep at times. He needs to stay up there. Who's your winner, most likely winner at this point? Ah, uh, France. Still? France. I, Even yeah. after the Hungary game, you didn't see enough there to make you concerned about... Well, no. I, I think they were playing in an environment that they wouldn't have been used to, a kind of a hostile environment, or an away game, effectively. Um, and they had a load of chances, and they were still quite direct against Hungary, I felt. And, and France, remember, had a very poor group stage in the World Cup, and then they got into another gear. I still think they have another gear. Benzema's uh, uh, place in the situation doesn't seem to have been a negative. I think they're the team that... I actually think the France-Germany game was better than people thought. And uh, I think that the, themselves and Italy have been the two most impressive teams for me in the competition so far. I'm still negative on the Dutch. Anything else going on today, John? Um, well, we got the matches tonight. So what's going to happen with Spain? Are they actually going to score some goals? Uh, they play Slovakia at 5 o'clock in Seville at the same time Sweden, who would top that group at the moment, Group E, take on Poland and St. Petersburg. So I really like that Alexander Isaac. He's been really impressive for me in the tournament so far. Then 8 o'clock this evening, the group of death comes to its conclusion. Germany against Hungary in Munich and uh, France against Portugal in Budapest. So that's what's going on in Euros wise today. Jim Bulger has been invited to the Dáil on July the 6th to substantiate claims over the issue of doping and horse racing. So senior members of Horse Racing Ireland, the Irish Horse Racing Regulatory Board and the Irish Race Horse Trainers Association and Bulger have been asked before an Oireachtas committee to address his comments in the public domain. So the Wexford trainer told the Sunday Independent recently there'll be a Lance Armstrong in Irish racing. Will he be there? What will be said? Absolutely fascinating to see what happens there. Um, the Lions, as you know, is going to be on OTB. Fantastic stuff. Uh, we got six uh, players from Ireland in the team to play Japan at Murrayfield on Saturday. Robbie Henshaw, Bundy Aki, Conor Murray, Ian Henderson, Tyg Byrne and Jack Conan. Warren Gatton said that he sees Byrne as a back row and he was also singing the praises of Henshaw uh, as a as a centre. So maybe Henshaw will be in line to start that first test against South Africa at the end of July. Michael Murphy also set to be back for the match between Donegal and Dan and Uri on Sunday in the Championship. He had a hamstring injury in the league game against Monaghan last month, but he's recovered. It's really crept up on his lads, the Championship, hasn't it? Oh, yeah. There's so many supplements. There's like Euro supplements, Lions supplements, and now Championship supplements. Well, plenty of uh, things to get your teeth stuck into in the newspapers today. JD, good stuff. Thanks a million. All right, lads. Take care. More from JD across the course of the week. And, of course, you can read his stuff on otbsports.com. It's 52 minutes past eight this morning. As part of the launch of a major new Think Road Safety campaign, Radio 1 DJ and co-host of that Peter Crouch podcast, Chris Stark has joined forces with grassroots football teams to deliver a passionate team talk to football lovers to keep them safe on the roads. Have a look at this. a message to all you drivers out there. It's been a tough few months. The roads around our stands fell quiet. Car parks were empty. Seats unsat upon. But now we're back and the beautiful game can continue up and down the country, across all the leagues. County FAs, men and women's divisions, the amateur leagues. Coins are being tossed all over the place. Ready for kickoff. It means that lots of us are back behind the wheel driving to matches. So let's make sure we do this right for yourself and for your team. Ballon d'Or. You probably think you know the local roads like the back of your hands, but you won't know what unexpected hazards are up ahead. You might be in a hurry, but there's no such thing as a safe way to speed. Don't be distracted by group chats. Fight the urge to check your phone when your hands should be on the wheel and your eyes on the road. On your head, Chris. See that? Nothing. Laser focused. Yeah! Oh! All right, lads, let's have a clean one today. Come on. Let's do this. It's coming home. I can feel it. You're going home safely. Respect. Chris Stark, good morning to you. How are you? I'm good, yeah. What you witnessed there was some of the finest acting 
that I think you guys would have ever seen, right? 100%, yeah. Up there, <laughs> up there with anything Mila Kunis has ever done. <laughs> Absolutely. Cheers, mate. How is your uh, Euros going so far? Ah, it's good. It's, um, yeah, it's, I don't know. It's been a funny experience because, you know, for me, I'm an England fan and, um, I feel I feel like we've actually done all right despite all the negativity that's that's around it all. Um and then last night was a kind of timely reminder that um actually when you look at where we are in the group it, you know it's been good and um and sort of on to the rest of the tournament. Why is there so much negativity? I don't know. I think it's uh, it's kind of like a very English way of supporting your team, isn't it? I mean, if you look at other teams um I think even sort of technically less good teams or those on paper that you would say were less good, they get more support from that underdog feeling and that that feeling like it's just going to go and give it a good go. And we never really harness that because no one is saying the England team is the best in, in Europe. So I don't understand why we can't sort of have a little bit of that attitude with it as well. Um, but but that's just the nature of it, I think. It's very complicated, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, I think so. I think so because ultimately we all we all want our relative teams to be as successful as possible. And I've always felt that with the national team, it feels slightly counterproductive when there's so much negativity around your own team. And also, the great thing about the Euros, and you know, I don't know if you guys agree, it's it's you know party time, and it's great to be, especially this year, seeing friends and family, and so. I kind of think as part of that, it'd be nice to for it to be such a positive experience. But, you know, I'm used to being an underdog. I'm a Watford fan. And uh, and so maybe I harness it a bit differently in my support. Yeah, I, I definitely think the team benefits from underdog status as well. And just that, that point about parties is really interesting because I haven't yet seen the, the mass outpouring of celebrations that, you know, the celebration videos. There's definitely been some, but it seems like it's almost more understated a little bit like people still don't quite know how to get back to normal. I think that's it. The Euros are at a bit of a funny time because, you know, there are certain, um, you know, certain parts of the UK open up, some parts of the UK are closed. Um, there's, a, you know, maybe uh, some kind of blurriness in the understanding of what some of the rules are uh, during this time. You know, you, you also have fan parks where people can go to and you know you're meant to sit down, and then I guess everyone's up celebrating. And so I think people are people are adjusting, and I think we're all going to go through a period of this where we're kind of adjusting to uh, sort of a maybe not a non-COVID time, but where it is less taking a hold of our lives. And and the Euros has come at that kind of time. I feel. So, so what's your match? viewing experience being Chris has a it clearly hasn't been throwing pints at one of your friends in a beer garden yeah I throw every every game I go and throw a pint over my wife just to <laughs> join in you know she uh, she stands up so I just throw a pint at her no um I don't know it for me it's been you know just celebrating at home um I've enjoyed the rest of the Euros like don't get me wrong I've been over at uh, people's houses and we've had little barbecues and stuff like that but it's a funny one. I also think like going to the game, I think it's amazing being able to go see live football again. But actually, I kind of think I don't really want to do that until everyone can be back in it, can be that that proper experience. It just feels a tad like uh, I'd rather be at home and, and having a little party with my mates than being in a stadium where it's like it's not how you remember it. It doesn't feel fully open. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's it's better, but not good yet. That's... Yeah, and I think it's lovely. Obviously, it's amazing to go see live football, but such a massive part of going and seeing live football for me is being there with mates and celebrating hard and shouting and cheering and that feeling of togetherness. And maybe I, look, I've, I've not been to a game to be able to say whether that is or, or isn't the case, but that's kind of what I'm excited for. So I'd rather wait until we can do it properly. Yeah, I think even last night at Hamden, having seen... Copenhagen in particular the previous night it was kind of like oh I, I've suddenly realised what a half empty stadium actually should feel like because when once fans started to come back it was like oh 20,000 people sounds like 100,000 people but actually when you compare it to Copenhagen it really doesn't a full stadium is everything when there aren't these gaps between rows of fans in, in, in the grounds 
Yeah, I agree. And and I think um, I think it's a lovely sentiment and we're all just reaching for positives where we can say that 20,000 people sounds like 100,000 people, but 100,000 people sounds like 100,000 people, you know, that's that's the reality of it. Um, and uh, so, so, yeah, I'm really excited for that. And, you know, obviously with this campaign that you guys just played out and thank you for doing that because uh, I still look at it and go... Um, uh, they should have got a, a really good actor for it, you know. <laughs> but I wanted to get involved because I think a lot of people are celebrating at home and, and parties and sort of rushing around. And, and I think the messages behind the campaign are, are really um, like a timely reminder during the Euros, if that makes sense. For sure. Uh, what do you, what's your take on the relationship between the, the English public and this specific team at the moment and, and like I mean you've you mentioned the fact that there's always going to be a bit of frustration with results or performances but in, in terms of this this bunch of individuals that this bunch of human beings what, what is the relationship like in, in your view well I think you're starting to see from an look from an England point of view I think you're starting to see new names become the prominent names that you see on the back of shirts um, you see people like Grealish being what everyone talks about you know and it was interesting what you were saying before, uh, before I came on about you know the stories from the Euros, and and uh, I think I think the relationship between uh, England fans and the England team is there's a real excitement about new players that are coming through. Um, I think there is a little bit of, and, and this happens with every tournament and and with every uh, England team that comes out. You know, everyone's got their own view on who should be starting. Um, and and then you have the performance last night, which vindicates some people, but also shows some people that, you know, they were probably wrong. I think one thing with being a football fan, I don't know if you guys agree, we don't make an atmosphere where you can actually hold your hands up at the end and go, actually, I, I was wrong there. Like, I shouted a lot about this player or this team, but it's not really the done thing to go, actually, you were right and I'm wrong. It's kind of just who shouts the loudest and, you know, I am right. And that's cool. Like, that's part of it. But um, it would be interesting to see as many tweets on social media from people going like, oh, fair play, actually. Yeah, I mean, that just doesn't <laughs> happen, though, right? <laughs> it doesn't in, happen. And even in social media in general, like, well, I often yeah. think this. Like, it would be great if we could um, create a bit more of an atmosphere where you, you, you don't just get judged on something that you tweeted or you put out many years ago, but that you can actually maybe just say, sorry, I was wrong. <laughs> it's like, this isn't set in stone, like... What I was then wasn't how I was now. I was angry last week, but I'm not angry now. And I wish there was a way that, and I don't know what it needs to be. I don't know if it needs to be a special function, or like an apology tweet. Flat, it, I don't know. It turns up in a different color. You know, like you get balloons on your birthday. Maybe it needs, I don't know, <laughs> something there. But I'd love to see a bit more of that. You're, it's basically uh, an apology to all Bakayo Saka fans from all Jaden Sancho fans. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, I just, I just think in sport, you know, most of the time, the irony is we are often wrong. And and actually, that's okay. That's part of it. Sport isn't VAR, really, is it? It's not perfect. It's not lines drawn. It's areas where you can be adamant about something before, but I've got it wrong, ultimately. And part of that paranoia of, I don't know, getting pulled up on, I don't know, a wrong sports opinion, I guess, takes away from the sports enjoyment. Like, I'm sure you want to be able to scream from the rooftops that you think that England are going to win the Euros, but maybe part of your social media brain is like, I can't really say that because if they don't, then I'm going to look like an idiot. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I've been guilty of this in the past. Like, I've tweeted about Watford. You know, I remember Watford playing City and we, I think we were 2-0 up. And um, I made the mistake of tweeting that, and then obviously we lost three two, and then and then it kicks off, you know. I think um, I think that's part. It's a fine line, isn't it? Because it's it's a fine line between all the kind of banter around it, and that's part of what I enjoy. I, I enjoy how ridiculous we all get about football, you know. I, I enjoy that it it stirs up so many feelings, but. Um, yeah, I guess you're right. Like, maybe there is something in the back of my head which is like, do do you want to be shouting this and tweeting this right now? Um, because you know what will happen if they don't. <laughs> where, where does... I know we're kind of judging this in a very different way, but where, where does this tournament rank in terms of hype around England and, and their team and their chances as opposed to all of the other tournaments that you've witnessed? That's a really interesting question because for me personally, it's felt like there hasn't been the sort of the overhype that there often is before tournaments, like the, the over ridiculous hype. If anything, I, I felt like the week before this tournament, people were 
all agreeing that the England team has a great lineup, but but were slightly more pessimistic or or some would say realistic about where they can get in the tournament. And the odd thing about that is then that makes me go the other way. And now I'm super optimistic. You know, I said to Crouchy, I, I, he, he said to me, what, what do I think will happen? And I said to him, well, I, I really think England will win it because this year feels different. And he shook his head and goes, you're just saying it because as an England fan, that's what you've got to say. And I said to him, well, you, you are right to a certain extent. As an England fan, it's like if someone asks, you just have to say, it's coming home. <laughs> but I, I did say, like, strap me up to a lie detector and ask me. And I think this could be a really interesting idea. We we put England fans on lie detectors and ask them if they really believe it's coming home. That's a great, that's a really good yeah, idea. That's... You should do that. <laughs> <laughs> so for, from someone uh, who knows Peter Crouch quite well, does he come with like his own sense of PTSD around being an England player at a major tournament? Yeah, it's an interesting one because like obviously we do the podcast together. And so I do think he he has to give some sort of like insight from a person who's experienced the game, but then is now, you know, retired and can look at it and, and criticize a little bit. And but he doesn't do that. His his default mode is England fan. And he always leans towards the positives with it. And I guess part of that is he's obviously friends with you know, a lot of the people that are involved. But, um, yeah, I think his... It's an interesting one because I, I do think... I do think this England team is really special. And, and the things that Crouchy says, Crouchy gives me an insight that I don't see just as a fan. Like, when you spend a bit of time with someone that's played in these matches, you realise the little bits of pressure and you look at the tunnel against Scotland, for example, and you see how that game is almost won in the tunnel. If you if you look at that bit before the game, um, ignoring all the COVID stuff and everything like that about this tunnel, um, but you just look at Andy Robertson's eyes. Like, he looks possessed. And you see him looking straight forward. And um, it's those little insights that I love from him because it's true, you can watch on TV and you can have your opinions on players and everything, but you can never truly understand that moment and how it feels for those people involved and how they then go and deal with that game. That makes a lot of sense. And I think one of the endearing things about Peter Crouch is that he is a fan and he just got to live his dream. That's like, so, uh, we'd, we'd have seen that with Kevin Caban as well. It was like the optimism about the team now never, never disappears for those guys because it's part of their story too. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. And I think ultimately, you know, every football team is standing on the shoulders of, of giants that have played before them. There's a huge amount of pride. So just because you retire, you still, I imagine, feel part of the process because you were part of a team that um, that has ultimately led to the current England team that there is. Do you, do you see what I mean? Yeah. It's a bit like a family it's passing down through the generations. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, and it's, I guess, quite a nice romantic way of looking at it. On that note, Chris, we wish you the very best of luck. Thanks a million for joining us. Cheers. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on, guys. It's uh, Chris Stark there. He's leading the campaign to try and get everybody to uh, not look at their phones when you're driving to football. Seems like a very good campaign to get behind. It's seven minutes past nine this morning here on OTBAM, brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. We, uh, I think, are going to take a uh, quick break and we'll be back talking Gaelic football. Uh, I'm going to tell you about what's coming up on OTV Sports Radio first. Uh, the Euro 2020 show is live from 11 o'clock today. Michael Owen talking about life after football. No texting mentioned uh, on OTV Gold at 1 o'clock today. Matt Rushmore's Dunny Gold, which is very appropriate given they're in action this weekend. Our retro panel is sport and our Irish identity at 4 o'clock. And OTV Gold is Dennis Ogie Moran watching a bit of the 1975 Ireland football final. Ogie Moran, the youngest player on the field. And Jesus, he was good. Have you seen that match? Uh, I can't remember last time I've seen it. Uh, is there a specific moment that sticks but out? Just in the first half, like Ogie, like the, the the other thing was that they were all men. They all they all had big, broad, barrel chests and shoulders. Every single one of them kind of wandered around like that, like they were like going to mm. kill you with their chest. They were going to lean on you and you're going to bait you into the ground like a hammer with their chest. I was like, wow, look, they look completely different as human beings. You know, they weren't the strength and conditioning, and they weren't all whippets. It was like, yeah, a feel of spuds and porter and beating you to death with my the chest. Massive, yeah, the chest, like the, the, the chest. Amazing. Presence. But Ogie had this like flowing locks and he was fast. 
Mm. And brilliant ball control. I was like, wow, that's look at the gift. He was also a centre forward. Yeah, what a what an unbelievable player. I don't know why. I, I I like obviously he wasn't in the half back line. He couldn't have been. But for whatever reason in my head, when he was winning his nine all Ireland's, it was as a defender. But obviously not. It was like a, a kind of um, a Brian McGuigan esque forward. Yeah, yeah, very much. But pretty much centre forward for for all those games. And um, as you said, the age on his side as he went to to join the. The growing list of those record uh, All Ireland winners at this point, obviously set to fall into the second tier eventually over the next couple of years, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, an, an, an all time great. That's a brilliant interview, actually, by the way, the one that's coming up later on, because Ogie famously doesn't do many interviews and uh, it's is is pretty shy when it comes to doing media work. But that's really interesting. Learned a lot from that piece. I think, I think Joe spoke to him a couple of years ago. Ten minutes past nine here this morning. We're going to take a quick break and we're back talking uh, Donegal and Mayo and whether or not they can actually be contenders this year. Next. OTB AM This is OTB Sports Radio. Have you subscribed to the OTB Football Podcast? If not, here's some of what you've missed over the last week. He put his hands on my, my shoulders and he started singing that Don't Worry Be Happy song to me. <laughs> I mean, it's blood and thunder and going in for tackles that, you know, he wouldn't normally go in for. I try and, like, want to go in, like, we wise sing this to kids. Kids are happy, but I just can't bring myself to... For the best Euro 2020 coverage, subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast wherever you get your podcasts and download the OTB Sports app. Invisible Threads, a Go Loud original. As we celebrate the sixth anniversary of marriage equality, Invisible Threads meets older members of the LGBTQ community who reflect on their journeys and tell their stories. From shame and isolation to conversion therapy, from living with fear to coming out as an older person. Join me, James O'Hagan, for this powerful eight-part series, winner of the first Go Loud podship. Subscribe to this podcast for free on the Go Loud app. Why not check out the Boyle Sports Betting app for the latest betting and stats on every player and team with the Boyle Sports Euro Stat Centre. Rated four and a half stars on the App Store, you'll find all our latest odds and offers for the Euros. So remind us where to go, Stevie G. Boyle Sports. This is betting. 18 plus bet responsibly. Gamblingcare.ie OTB AM With Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. All right, it's uh, 11 minutes past nine and I'm delighted to say we've got David Brady and Brendan Deveni with us to uh, chat about both of their respective counties and uh, just how much we can believe in either Mayo or Johnny Gall. Brendan, I might start with you because the news coming through in the last 24 hours is that we expect that Michael Murphy will be fit to have some role against Down this weekend. What, what's, what are your whispers? What are you hearing? Yeah, same as that. Uh, the two boys are uh, are back. That most of the Donegal injuries have cleared up. I think McNeilis is only one, but as you said, Murphy's been the been a huge one for 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 Donegal. There's a lot of talk about whether starting him or not. I think with that type of injury, Jerry, you're really re- really ready to go or not. And I think particularly with what's coming down the line for for Donegal, Michael's going to have to get a couple of games under his belt after the times off if Donegal are to progress. So I don't think there's that chance where they can afford to leave it out because you know down are capable of of putting it up to Donegal and I think for Declan Bonner to hold him in reserve would be a, a very dangerous call yeah it sends the wrong message out to everybody else like oh look we're going to be okay without this whereas you stick him in the team it was like oh this is you know it is the Ulster Championship the the graveyard of the Ulster Championship is littered with champions with aspirations for, for sure <laughs> including last year Jeremy you think about it I mean, Donegal didn't walk away from, from our man after the Ulster final and, and, and thinking that they should have beat Cavan. But I think Down certainly did uh, in the semi final when they had, they had Cavan completely beat. I mean, they were nine up at half time and cruising, playing some unbelievable football. So I think when you look into these small things, as we do here, you know, into the league campaign, then Donegal played okay, I suppose, against Tyrone and then fairly poorly against Monaghan. And, just managed to pull a draw out against Armagh. I don't think we can read anything into the Dublin game. And I suppose uh, Down started off the league pretty poorly, you know, getting well beaten by Mayo and then by Meath, but then turned it around. And a really good last performance, you know, to, to stay up against uh, Leash in, in the playoff and um, hitting two, I think they had 2-19 in that game. So those kind of things bode well for Down coming into this game. You just feel, Jerry, all this build up and you're looking at potential matchups down the line and that. It's just such a shame that someone has to go out uh, and that's the, the season o- over. And I think Paddy Talley's been talking about turnover of squads and 
And you just look at the the, the teams outside of the, the top eight and that and the commitment they have to put in as year. And a big part of that, I think, with down is turnover of players. They keep losing sways and sways of players. Like Paddy Talley was saying, there's maybe people committing to, you know, two, four, five years. It's, well, other counties, play, players are in for, you know, at least your kind of 10 years and you can work with your best players. So I think that's something we've got to be very uh, cautious of in, in football going forward in terms of, you know, trying to make a, a competition that, that keeps everybody involved that you get your best players in there because certainly that's a huge issue in down. I think it's really obvious and look I don't want to bring this back to structures because the, the games are here now and we can actually talk about them as opposed to the dark winter months when we've nothing to talk about but the structures but it is true and it's particularly pronounced this year and last year when there has been straight knockout uh, DB I want to ask you about the the general pall of despair that must be over Mayo at the moment with the Killian O'Connor news because you know we just got to the point where somebody had had correctly counted all of the figures and his scoring is off the charts and it was 60 championship games and only 40 league games we were like well this is the year where that young set of players have had a year in the squad and they know exactly what's needed from them but we have Killian we have Dermot O'Connor we've Aidan O'Shea who had a, an injury scare but was actually okay it looked like it was all set up for a push and now Without Killian, is there anybody in Mayo who thinks that they can come good? Um, there is, yeah. And I'd say it's about 32 people, and that's the, the squad themselves and James Horn and his management, because, uh, look, at it is a massive blow. He, like, he went off, I think it was three minutes into injury time in the first half, and he had won four in the bag against Clare. Um, that all be a, from, a, from a penalty, but it's a massive loss. But it's not something that they're not used to as such. Killian... As you said, um, when you quantify the, the the number of games he's played versus his uh, his return, it's phenomenal. And there's been kind of a, a consistent, not a consistent, but Killian has been injured uh, regularly enough, and he's been missing missing from uh, I suppose mostly league for 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 uh, big quantities of time. But uh, it's it's um, you you just can't say to yourself, uh, Mayo are the force they are without Killian. Uh, they're not. But I don't think um, I don't think they're going to be just great at no hopers all of a sudden on the back of that. And again, um, I have no insight into it, and I haven't uh, really asked of, of anyone. But Killian is out now. Um, is he out in five weeks' time, um, six weeks' time? That is that is the question. And uh, it's uh, I don't think it's a it's a ruptured uh, tendon. But if there is something to be done or an operation to be had. It would make him very, very doubtful. But I wouldn't rule him totally out. Uh, but what it leaves James Horan is in a position to say, right, uh, we can only only work with what we have right now. And uh, I think it's it's maybe a time not to gamble, but I, I think he needs to say to himself, uh, where do I where do I try and uh, cover or, or replace Killian and uh, not not take away too much from my defence? For me. Um, I think it would it will be only a matter of time before we see the likes of of Ushin Mullen, who has been absolutely phenomenal from the first day he's been on a Mayo jersey uh, from cornerback position. I think it's only a matter of time we see him coming out, uh, and I would love to see what he could do in a half back line or maybe even in a half hour line playing that defensive role. But his attack and prowess, his speed, is uh, he's so comfortable on the ball. I think. Maybe, maybe you're kind of saying to yourself, "Do I have another option?" Um, you're robbing Peter to say Paul, but uh, Paul, Paul is um, Paul is in Killian O'Connor is a massive loss, and how do you try and inject some kind of uh, positive momentum and uh, something new to the to the table? I, I know it's a it's a short championship, but uh, I do think um, the players that are are, are there, like it, it went against me being in Division Two um, to a degree. Uh, because you 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 um, you have in that quality a game, but if you look back, it was only six months ago that we had an Ireland final, so it's not a lifetime ago. And I, I think the the Mayo team will have to just forget about Killian and the likes of uh, you know it, it, maybe the likes of Conor Loftus, who uh, would be probably classed as their their next dominant free taker. Um, you have the possibility of. Um, Ryan O'Donoghue, or you have Kevin McLaughlin to step up to free take and duties. But again, when you have a free taker, you need to have a return percentage mm. of around 85 to 90 percent all the time. Did, did you think Mayo were a little bit overlooked before the O'Connor injury, David? Just because everybody was was talking about this, Kerry Dublin, uh, the, the, the two of them on on top of the tree, and everybody else trailing behind them. But as you say, there Mayo All Ireland finalists last year. So did you think they were written off a little bit too soon? 
Uh, I look at, at the end of the day, um, Mayo weren't, they didn't set the world alight in Division 2. Uh, for me, my one concern would be from a defensive point of view. Um, two goals conceded in every game. Um, the last day, their back scored 1-7. Um, the only two to score was Young Hessian and, uh, and Rob Henley. Um, you know, it was massive contribution, but that's the way Mayo play. And I think when we think about losing Killian O'Connor, we are, yes, from a scoring point of view. But the way that Mayo set up, I think Killian would be a major loss because he is, is without doubt, and it's a cliche, yes, the first line of defence. He pushes back, he comes back so deep, looks for turnover ball, but then you have the let them loose effect where you have your big runners, you have your fast guys on the ball, um, the Ushin Mullins, the Lee Keegans, the Paddy Durkins of this world that are so comfortable going forward, knowing that the breakdown, the turnovers happen with the likes of Killian or Tommy Connery coming back and they have space, but they just need to, they need to be cognizant that their first job is defence. And I think even that link from Killian will be a loss, but um, it's it's not un- unsurmountable. And look, at, it's, 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 we're, we're talking about a whole new championship, a whole, it is right, we're going into it in the next couple of weeks. What is it, six, seven weeks is nearly going to be over. Um, and and at, at that stage, there's going to be more injuries in the Mayo camp and every other camp from it. Yeah. And, and it's something that you talked about as well. The amount of niggles and the amount of small injuries that players are bringing into this championship and will bring in once the, the pace is is, uh, is turned up is going to uh, is going to increase because look at it, it's been sedimentary for everyone ourselves. Um, but the one the one good thing and I do it is a positive vibe from me always that guys aren't doing the tonight right you're going down you're spending five and a half six hours traveling up and down to me or you're training you're back at one o'clock that's a big benefit to me or they've had a number uh seven to nine at times uh players traveling by bus down and, and the fact that the very the vast majority of them are based at home now is a positive because they're down in castle bar they're down in mayo and that that allows for a, a better uh, a, a better momentum and training Brendan, there's a sense that this Dublin team for the first time in a couple of years are closer to the pack than they have been in recent years by virtue of the fact that a bunch of players have moved on or aren't playing for whatever reason, that the strength and depth isn't there. Now, uh, excellent performances from, say, Paddy Small in the the recent league game uh, and they still have the core of the team in uh, Conn is there, Fenton is there, uh, Kieran Kilkenny is there we don't know if the goalkeeper is going to be there or not there's a possibility he has retired and we don't know it yet we'll, we'll wait and see exactly what the crack is with that Do you, is it is it real that they're actually a bit closer to the pack than they have it in previous seasons or are we kind of trying to kid ourselves in the hope that we get a proper championship maybe they're getting fed up just Jerry that's what we're hoping for um, we've had enough hey, we're going to take a break but uh, yeah they're so hard to beat under Dublin every game you know um Particularly if we're looking at those league games there, how they play and what they do. Like, like I was shocked at them in, uh, in the second half against Donegal. They're seven points up and the full 15 goes inside the 45. I, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing, you know, for the for the greatest team that's, that's ever played the game to go into that type of shape. They're so rhythmic. I mean, it's, it's tactics beyond belief. I mean, they've got the talent to back that up. It's a bit scary. I mean, I always think if you're that good, just go out and beat teams, you know. Within reason, you're going to drop players back, of course, keep your defensive shape. But that would that would worry me. Um, it looks like they're happy enough to go on to whatever shape is needed to constantly, constantly win, which, you know, is sport, but it's also very robotic. And sure, yeah, I mean, Comerford's coming in. I mean, I don't know how much that'll weaken him. He, he seems to be top top class as well. So, like, it's it's that squad of Dublin's. And even against Donegal, those other players didn't really perform that well, but yet they were so far ahead, you know. And you mentioned a few of them there, you know, with quite, quite, Fenton was quite, quiet with Kilkenny, and Con was in and out of the game. And as you said there, someone's always going to step up uh, on the day for them. I wouldn't read much into what Donegal put out that day other, you know, Donegal just wanted to get through injury free and, and not get a spanking, a bit like what Throne got uh, against Kerry. I think that was the big thing for, for Donegal. So I wouldn't read into their performance at all. But as for Dublin, it's just that question mark again. But certainly at the moment, if you're looking at form, you'd have to say Kerry are the, the form team in the country. They're the team that's, that's definitely shaking it up. Yeah, um, what's, one... what's going to come out of Ulster? It's, it's hard to know. I, I certainly think the Ulster Championship in, in itself is more interesting than All-Ireland because of this Dublin spectre. Because everybody's going to have a cut of each other in Ulster. And there's so many fascinating tussles coming down the line. Uh, for me, it, it's, it's where a load of interest lies before we get into the semis. 
Uh, uh, David, we've talked before. I remember when we were talking about what you do with the the blanket defence and the sweeper, and your solution at the time was to push forward and have an extra forward and, and go and be more attacking. And it feels a little bit like that's kind of what's happened. Uh, that teams have decided, particularly over the last eighteen months, that if you're going to lose games, you may as well lose games scoring a lot to give yourself a chance in a shootout. I don't know if, if what we've seen in the league is evidence of that or if it was specific to the league. And it'll be very interesting to see what happens in the Ulster Championship over the next couple of weeks if, if teams do go defensive. But like the one thing that you'd say about Kerry is that they have built a team which is now designed to take advantage of the fact that Dublin go one-on-one with their defenders in many instances. Obviously, as Brendan said, they will drop players back. Like you've got to give credit to Kerry for developing a style that they think is going to beat the dubs as opposed to uh, be a... a, a a copy of them or something similar to them. Yeah, and again, you give credit to Curry for creating a style, but it's it's nothing else has worked. So they've had to say to yourself, how do we how do we do something different? Um, and again, once you have the firepower, um, you're kind of going right. We need to focus on our key strength. And looking from the key strength, from the if you look at the Clifford O'Shea or O'Brien or, or Moynihan, like the the the, the they're massive. Um, uh, scorers, that they're massive. They're they're a massive threat, and I think Curry are really focusing on their main strength, which is their scoring power and their scoring threat. And again, I like um, when you have Spillane uh, and and uh, you have Moore or, or O'Connor in midfield. You have that platform as well, but you have to use your sense because the rest, what everyone else has done over the last couple of years, hasn't worked. Uh, and again, it's not that you set out your whole your whole um, ethos or your whole year is focused on, oh, forget about the Galways, forget about the Corks, forget about the Tyrones, let's focus on Dublin. That's not really it, but you're going to yourself. Um, it's kind of an evolution to say, we got to meet um, fire with fire, and, and they, again, you can't look at defending, and all of a sudden you're seven points down, and you come out of your shedding going, oh no, now we have to revert it back to something totally different. And that's what's often happened with Dublin in the past, or teams against Dublin. But uh, I do think that that uh, squads have kind of said to themselves, well, let's develop um, more power, firepower and let's develop a better way of, of, of attacking and playing that uh, an attacking game. And, and, and we're seeing it. Like the, the scores from games um, is great to see. Um, like the, 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 the level of score, whether it's 216, 222, 123, like there's, there's massive scores. And that's because the game is more open, more fluid. Again, as Brendan says, Dublin have that uh, ability and tendency to say right uh, and it's not the first time and it won't be the last time that you'll have 14 behind the ball numerous times over the last few years but it's what they do when they break it down and the way they counter attack that really um, blurs your mind to say well they're very defence focused they are but um, uh, going back on the um, on the, on the Dublin keeper um, from an Evan Coverman Cover from point of view uh, Cluxton, Cluxton uh, Stephen Cluxton has probably done exactly what Cluxton was going to do. He was going to bow out. Uh, and from my mind, uh, I don't I, I don't see him being any part of the Dublin um, panel this year because for all intents and purposes, the word in the street is that he's retired and he's in, and he's gone on, on his terms. And uh, we won't know and we won't see the real, um, the real, you know, the, 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 the weakness from that perspective until the, the white heat of battle. Sure. When Cluxton has been absolutely sublime, superb in the way that he's directed games, he's controlled games, and he's restarted games on the back of a maybe it's 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 coming level or the, a goal scored against him, which is very rare. But um, it's only then when we see you know what is he missed, and I think he he will be massively. So you, you think just silently, no statement, no nothing. Stephen Cluxton's hung up the gloves. Yeah, honestly, and I've asked. Um, and I'm not saying I was told. I was told to fuck off and mind my own business. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you look at um, and it's it's the fact that it's even Jim hasn't, uh, you know, our uh, Desi hasn't been in the media spotlight and these questions being asked. Uh, and Mick Gavin is is holding the fort um, and not doing media. It it's it's it, 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 it is pure and utterly obvious. Uh, and there's no way. That uh, you know that you missed the whole entire league, and all of a sudden um, you're back because you've been rested. Uh, Clubson was never a man to rest, and uh, I honestly do think um, that he is he has he has done it on his terms, albeit um, probably the way Dublin would do it uh, under the radar. 
but um, it would be disappointing. But I, I, I honestly do think that that uh, something something has has happened, and it's only from a, a walking away into the sunlight perspective. I think it's happened. Even Jim Gavin released a statement, David. That this would be truly unprecedented if Cluxton were to go out with with such silence. Like I, I, I remember I was I was there when Mick Alvin was being interviewed after the game in Thurles a, a month back, and he said that. Cluxon was uh, a few weeks from coming back. Now, in fairness, he has lined out for Parnell, so like, that obviously raised a few flags for people as well. Oh, without a doubt. So, boys, man, this, is a, this is not a very big puzzle. And if you put all the pieces together, you say to yourself, well, you know, um, he, 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 he's, he's, look, if he's coming back from injury, your obvious thing is to, to, be, in, uh, to be in training with your county team or play one or two club games to get back into the group. Mm. But um, you'd, uh, I can guarantee you, if 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 Stephen was one hundred percent on the whip, on the road back, um, the games you want to play in is the AB games. You're in the, the the high intensity games of your own county panel, uh, not from a, a Parnell's perspective. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, right. it's 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 going to be the 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 story of the summer told in the winter. Breaking news there from uh, DB this morning. No. I- I was told, hey, hey, <laughs> I was told to take off and mind my own business. Okay. But anyway, okay. you have to, you have to, you have to see it that way. Yeah, uh, look, I, and I think until we see him again, you're gonna have, people will doubt that we, we'll see him again until we see him again. I think that's the case with anybody at that stage of their career in, in many ways. We've only got like a minute left here, uh, Brendan. What is what is success for Donegal this year? Yeah, well, they're, they're going for what have been nine of the last ten Ulster finals. It's the semi final. It's, it's, it's caught us, you know, last three seasons. We've been a, a game away. But listen, look, just looking at Ulster, you know, you think about it here, if Donegal get over down, Derry are, are moving well and I pose some problems. If, if Donegal were to go over that, then it's Tyrone. Then it's an Ulster final against an Arma or a, or, or a Monaghan, potentially, if they, uh, depending on how that side goes. So, you know, massive amount of games. That's eight games for Donegal in, in 10 weeks then, leading into an All-Ireland semi, should they get that far. So, massive workload, uh, Jerry, for Donegal to come up and so much to happen. But you'd have to think success this year for Donegal would be at least to finally make a semi-final. That would be your thinking at this point against uh, Kerry. Yeah, and we're dying to see them in Croker in those games with a fully fit team and the opportunity to show us the full array of their talents. We just haven't had that in recent years and that's kind of obviously been one of the things that COVID has stolen from us. Lads, great stuff. It's great to be talking about football, which is imminent this weekend. My thanks to David Brady and to Brendan Devenny for joining us this morning. Do you think Luxon is retired, Owen? Oof, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure. Like, I mean, it's, Would it make a difference if he had in yes. how, you, how you handicapped the... the rest of the season? Yes, absolutely it would. It, it absolutely would. I think that uh, Evan Comerford absolutely has the skill set to go and t- take that jersey for the, the next for a very, very long time. But it's just getting up those minutes in like, in, in Croke Park when if, there's no Ireland on the line. Yeah, if, if Cluxton has retired, it's like a stop all the clocks, hang the flags at half mast and like it's a massive outpouring of love and emotion from the Dublin football fans and probably for from fans from around the country for what he's done for the game. Like it is... You know, it's a huge moment and I, I hope that uh, he gets that moment because he deserves that moment as opposed to just quietly slipping off and us kind of piecing it together and going, oh, I see what you did there, you know. Mm. Uh, yeah, it would be a shame because he does deserve it. He's been the, the, like the leading figure in the greatest team Gaelic football has ever seen. So uh, like it's, it, it is a massive immediate impact uh, on this championship if Stephen Cluxon has retired and it is a massive legacy story as well for Gaelic Games as a whole. This will be the biggest story of 2021 if he actually has retired. Uh, I would like to think though that, that like, I mean, at least Dublin GEA would just <laughs> stick out a statement for him or, or, or something, but maybe maybe there's I, we don't know what's at play here. OTVAM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette. Put your best foot forward with their new and improved razors. The Euro show is on its way at 11 this morning. If you missed any of today's show, full podcast will be up shortly. Search OTB AM on the OTB Sports app or wherever you get your pods and make sure you hit subscribe and give us an L rating as well. We're back on air and online from 7 o'clock tonight. Here's former teenage football sensation Sonny Pike speaking to Joe about dealing with fame, his father and falling out of love with the game. We pick up the conversation with him talking about training with Ajax as a schoolboy. So, uh, so we go... Um so we leave my house to, to, to go, for instance, and then there's like camera crews watching me leave my house with all boot, my boots in the bag and everything else. And they're saying like, can you walk out the house and do this? I'm like, yeah, but we ain't leaving for another 
a couple of hours yet, but saying I'm not, I'm still not even not to be gone to it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so there was Transworld Sport, there was Blue Peter, and there was two other Dutch camera teams out there, uh, NJS or something, and another two Dutch camera crews out there. So yeah, so we done went out with Transworld Sport and and Blue Peter. When we got off the other side, we met Tom Pronk, who was like a defender, played for the first team when he was running the academy. He met us at the other side, and we're shaking hands with him and this Dutch camera crew's filming that. Uh, he takes me to a place in, like, the middle of the streets of Amsterdam. And, you know, like, so, for instance, you know, like, townhouses where they're built up like that, and you had to walk down into, like, it was the, the, the lower ground of it, sort of thing, in the basement. They had, like, this little room. I don't know if it was actually his or a friend of his, that was our place to stay. Mm. We put, like, uh, at our bed, it was, like, pretty simple, basic, quite dark, actually, down there. Um, we had a, like, a big double bed and a, and a toilet, and we put, like, Ajax flags above the door, uh, above the bed, and a couple of posters, and it was just, like, us setting up to sort of go and do our thing in Ajax, which was yeah. lovely. Um, yeah. We went to the training ground, started to train, um, the coach used to speak in English, then he'd say and talk in, in Dutch. We met uh, Van Gaal. Van Gaal come in. I'm watching the f- uh, first team train from out a window, and uh, I'm just sitting there talking with my dad. Was ha- my dad was having a cup of tea. And Van Gaal come in and said, like, see us drinking. He gave me some biscuits. Mm. And I was like, oh, thanks. And my dad was like, who's that? I said, that's mm. Van Gaal. That's the first team manager. He's like, mm. he didn't know if it was like some kids are just doing a bit of cleaning up. <laughs> he didn't have a clue. <laughs> uh, and then I end up going watching them train. And at that point, I'm watching like uh, Overmars, uh, Canu, uh, the De Boer brothers, Littman, Bergkamp. And I'm like watching the first thing train and things like that. I believe we're getting to meet them all. Yeah, it was nice. It was some team. So in that yeah. week week of training, I mean, it was kind of interesting how Ajax were ahead of English football, very much so at that stage. You're doing funny things like clapping your hands over your head when you're dribbling, you know, to develop technical skills. Yeah. It's right up your street. You quite like it. You hold your own. I mean, I'll, I'll, so so they seem to send you a letter, letter afterwards and say, look, he's not necessarily better than what we have here, but we do want to keep tabs. Let's let's keep in touch over the intervening years. So did you kind of feel you were at that level? I know there were, there were uh, it'll probably turn out you trained with a bunch of players who went on to have good careers at that during that yeah. week, but you felt you were kind of at that level? Technical, technically, I, I felt <clears throat> definitely at that level is, is as good, if not better than some of them. Okay. I was the thing was I t- as I say it's in the book that the, the, the I like for instance like all the training I've done really well I was like sort of getting lost in it I was really I was I was so comfortable but and they they set it up for the end of the week that we had a match mm. and uh, on the day of the match I think it was like a two o'clock kickoff and like at five o'clock in the morning my dad told me a few days before that I had to get up at five o'clock in the morning pitch black can't see a hand in front of my face. And we have to do me dribbling through the streets on the cobbles where the sun comes up. They took me to the flower market. They were taking me to me all different different points of interest to do interviews. And I did interviews until like say 12, 1 o'clock. So I'd done like six or seven hours mm. a day, like pretty much a day's work. And then I had to go and play the match. And I remember doing the warm up. They just had a little warm up across the pitch. And like, can we sprint halfway across the pitch, like, you know, like you do across sideways? Yeah. And I was just like, oh my God, I'm a bit nice. I'm a bit tired. You know what I mean? I was a bit knackered. But uh, I done well. We drew one all when I scored from outside the box. So I did well. Um, mm. But I was tired. I weren't as sharp as what I usually be. Uh, so I felt in that game, I could have probably done a little bit better, even though I probably looked like I did okay. But I, I, I did think to myself, I could have been sharper. Yeah. But obviously, I had a lot of other commitments that I had to sort of uphold and do uh but yeah generally yeah it was it was it was a good experience yeah that week where the filming happens even on the day of the trial match that's probably the first time in the book where you get a sense that the marketing aspect of this whole thing is starting to take over the football inside you know the priorities have kind of gone awry and it was uh, so striking so on return from Ajax again quirky story so different Ajax media love it so Year seven, your attendance was about 50%. And in the two and a half months after your training week with Ajax, mm. in those two and a half months, you do 64 media events. Everything from, as we yes. said, the Deal and Skinner, Hello Magazine, et cetera. And, and sponsorship starts to come into this. So suddenly, like, this goes from being kind of a cutesy story to we can make some money out of this. So McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Mizuno... 
all of this stuff starts being being thrown at you. What's your memory of that period? Maybe that that six months, year after IAX, when all of this big stuff starts happening. Just, just like you said, just really busy. Just literally spending a lot of time going into like big offices, like big glass offices, having meetings with people on big massive tables. I'm just walking around these offices, thinking like, what am I doing here, talking to all these like guys in suits and that? And they say like say ten guys around. Like for instance, I'm thinking now I'm talking there like the Coca Cola. They sent me up into, oh, we want you to be the Coca-Cola kid. And we sent me on a big ball meeting table. My dad's there on one side, and then just like, say, six or seven other guys on the other side and whatever else in their suits. And they had, like, a big white ball behind. And I remember them just had a, a big triangle written on it. And then at the bottom, it was saying, like, Coca-Cola working in this here for football grassroots, so for instance. Then the next section would be, like, uh, like say, championship. And then it was, like, the Coca-Cola Cup final. And then at the top, very top cube, it said uh, the Coca-Cola kid. And they, then they pointed to me and said, that's you. And I was like, okay. I was like, oh, my God, like, it's like a bit surreal, really. But, yeah, just a lot of time spending around talking to people in suits and everything else and just thinking to myself, like, I just want to play football, to be honest with you. What am I doing out here talking to all these people all the time? Yeah. And so at that stage, say 10, 11, 12, you're probably a bit young. Uh, well, you're certainly too young to sign professional forms. <laughs> And scouts were approaching your father all the time. I didn't quite, couldn't quite work out why at 10, 11, 12, 13, you say you weren't necessarily training every week with a Premier League club. Like, why hadn't that happened? It seemed like it just, it would just, it was just like offer after offer, or I'm talking to this guy, and it seemed you were flooded with attention, but you weren't maybe settling into <clears throat> a nice, a nice rhythm of training with a, a professional academy somewhere. Yeah, well, this was this was it. So I was at a team called Child and Youth. And that's where I was getting a lot of attention, still getting scouted left, right and centre, like yeah. what you said. Uh, and then I think the fact that I ended up going to Leighton Orient eventually after a few years, but I think the fact that I was sort of not, sort of not turning down clubs, but the fact that I wasn't sort of joining a club, and I think maybe if I, and my dad would have known if I would have gone into a club and they sort of said, like, no, nah, we need to sort of get on his football now, I think he knows that's what would have happened. And I think it was just like sort of hold back that sort of side of it, and let's keep going with that. And then maybe he was thinking, right, then we'll throw him into an academy and do that. But obviously he didn't get to that stage because of what happened. Uh, yes, but okay. that, that that's in my mindset. That's what I'm sort of thinking that he was thinking. Yes, and, okay. and then we did end, we did end, eventually end up at, at Leighton Orient. Mm. But then obviously the next sort of thing happens. Okay, well, that kind of makes sense. So, I mean, if we go into an academy, they ain't going to be having me doing... No, my like, hello Ramble magazine Ramble Ramble and Badil Skinner yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So let's let's keep everything going. And like in terms of money from McDonald's and Coca Cola and Mizuno, I mean, was it big money or were they taking advantage as well? Or what's your do you do you even know? Uh, so what I was told after uh, for the McDonald's advert, it could have got up to ninety thousand pounds, nearly up oh. to a hundred thousand pounds, which I never got. I, think I got like maybe a few hundred quid or so, okay. uh, and then. The Coca-Cola, I didn't, I can't even remember how much I got for that, but we worked it out not long after, and people was coming to me and spoke to a few agents only a few years after, and they said, you lose it like maybe a quarter of a million pound, you should have you'd have been earning at that sort of stage. Uh, I, I did get some money off Mizuno, uh, but I think it was like, a, I want to say about £2,000 a year, and I did that for two, two years. Uh, and I did get little bits of money here and there, but really, when you look back at it, what it should have been, it was like, not even a couple of percent, maybe. Right, okay. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and like 200 grand back in 90s, is probably might be even talking a million pound now. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So did you say you should have got that or you did get that and it went elsewhere? Or you, you, you didn't get it, the two the two hundred. No, I, I just, I didn't get it. I didn't, okay. I didn't get it whatsoever. Well, this is actually an, a bit what just made me remember what you're saying there. I remember getting a Sky Sports Award yeah. in 94 and 95. So when all the players in the Premier League are picking up their awards, at the, halfway through, they'd say, and for the youngest player, the, the wonder kid or whatever, up-and-coming player, they'd give me mine. So I'd get my, I'd go up and pick my award, and it'd be Alex Ferguson, yeah. uh, Kenny Dalgleish, Shearer, all clapping me, going, well done, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, uh, and, and, and actually, on this, I remember coming back on the first time they gave it to me and looking in the back of the car, was, they just sent me a limo, and looking back at it, and like it was a gold award, it's a sky written on it, and it was like looks solid gold. And I remember being a young kid, I was 
12, yeah. looking at it and thinking, is that solid gold? Like, is that, is that actually solid? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, but actually generally thinking to myself, like, I've done, I've done, I've done it. Like, look, I've got like, the whole, all my idols are clapping me, telling me how well I've done mm. and looking at it and thinking like, cool, like, I've literally hit the jackpot already. we realistically, I'm probably 10%, 5% on the journey. Do you know what yes, I mean? I'm like 12 yes. years old. Like, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah. That's, and it, it, it just but, showed the power of marketing. I think Eric Hall was, became an agent as well who wouldn't necessarily be football. Like, there's a kind of showbiz element there as well. Yeah. It just, it showed, like, in so much as anything as well, the culpability of the media, I thought, reading it. Like, media here, oh, he's the next Maradona. Okay, we'll promote him as the next Maradona without any fact-checking, without any sense of what's appropriate. It was just like... Yeah. This kid is unbelievable. Wait and you see this kid, and sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, off it goes. Yeah, it's a train, man. Just ball rolls, yeah, that's it. There was no sort of, yeah, just, just literally, just kept going and kept going and kept going. Yeah, and it was that's, out of control. That's the truth. It was just out, out of control. control. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> out of control. That said, so the next Maradona, who knows? But certainly, really promising player, one hundred percent. So it gets to a stage where, despite all this industry going on in the background, you are training with Orient. And then you get taken to do some training with Chelsea. Initially, Chelsea are thinking, are you not signed with Orient? And they're reassured by your dad, I think. Oh, no, 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 we haven't signed. Yeah. So train away with Chelsea. All the while, there's a film crew with you, which I guess is not that unusual in that your life had a lot of film crews around. And you're told it's a documentary about you. And I guess you think, well, it's not so weird. There's a documentary about me. After all, I am, you know, the next uh, yeah, big thing. Really, um, yeah, yeah so. you've, you've done loads. So then you sit down to watch this documentary and... It turns out it's like almost a sting operation and Greg yeah. Dyke, the future FA chairman, is involved in it. And it's sort of presented as here's big Chelsea poaching an Orient player. So yeah. you're in the documentary, but like you're not the focus of it. It's about you're the pawn. You're the yeah. This yeah, is yeah, yeah. who Chelsea poached. And so they have footage of you training at Chelsea. They have footage of you with Orient. I and yeah. I guess all hell breaks loose. What age were you when this one happened? That's full. Team. So okay. that's the sort of that's the end. I say ten to fourteen. So that that's fourteen. That's sort of the end of it, really, yeah. because that's when I get to see. Because like in between ten and fourteen, I'm sort of in this match where like my when my mum and my my football coach is on one side saying like, Sonny, concentrate on your football. You're doing this is taking too much. And then my dad's on the other side like, we need to keep going. We need to keep doing this sort of thing. And I'm caught in between the whole time. Like it's tough to sort of manage uh, mentally. But then when I was 14, when that came out and it wasn't what I knew it was on the on the, on the the TV and I'm watching it and I'm like, whoa, whoa, what's all these people in it? Like Scott Parker was in it and a lot of other players that ended up making it was all in it. And yeah. I was just told it was a documentary about me. And it was just, as I'm watching it, I'm just thinking like, what the hell is going on in this documentary? And um, I actually run out into the road uh, and I, I, I'm standing in the middle of a roundabout and just cars are whizzing around me. And I'm just thinking, half of me is just thinking, like, I could do a jump in front of one of these cars just to stop this, like, because my head was spinning. Mm. Um, and, and and my dad wasn't there. He didn't come and watch it, which was un, which was strange for him because a lot of the yes. time we did stuff, even if my mum and dad wasn't together, he would always sort of come along and say, oh, that was good, when it, son, yes. and whatever yes. else. So, I, like... I, I he, should say, sorry for people, when you say your dad wasn't there... Terry, your coach, who seems like a great fellow, was there. There was like a a, a room booked in the local pub to, for that's people it, to it, get yeah. together and watch it. So people yeah. were there. Then your dad hadn't that's showed it, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he hadn't showed up. Yeah. yeah. So as I said, and then after, and then yeah, and then after that, that was the first time I seen something. I thought, wow, like this is really going the wrong way now. This is sort of that's it. Like I, I know myself now. Next time I see my dad, I've got to say to him, like, that's it. We're done. I yeah. can't do no more media whatsoever. I need to really concentrate on my football and forget it. And uh, and that was happened about four four or five weeks later. I'm training with Terry uh, over my local uh, over over at my school. They used to let me use the football pitch at my school. And um, he comes over, walks over by the gate, and he says to me like, "Son, son, I've got some more." I mean, I hadn't seen him for, since the documentary's landed. Okay. He said, "I've got some more work for you. I've got some more stuff for you to do." I said, "Dad." I can't do it no more. I said, that's it, it's done. And it was the first time, loads of times before I said, like, come on, I want to stop saying this. But this time I'm actually telling him, no, no, that's it, it's finished. And he's just like, he went to me, well, if that's what you're saying, he goes, I ain't got a son no more. And I was just like, and that, that hit me like a ton of brick. So even just saying it to you now, I can still feel that little feeling just come through me now. Uh, and that just sort of hit me like a ton of bricks. And I turned around um, 
And I said, oh, it looks like I ain't got a dad no more. And I walked back into Terry and uh, I say to Terry, like, what he said. And he's just, and he, and I was about, I was, I was going to, I think I swore. And, and Terry was like, don't you swear this, that, and the other. And I told him what he said. And he just threw a ball at me. And I just sort of remember just doing kick ups, mm. just sort of just thinking, I like, should try and put that out of my mind for a while as much as I could. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. So that's, that's the sort of bit where it takes it into that sort of the low, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, it's horrific. It's horrific. And it's a mm. desperate thing to go through. And the other horrible fallout from this thing is you end up being banned from football for a year, which seems <clears throat> insane. I like I, I really don't think it would happen today. So you're you're banned from football for a year. Yeah, from an academy sort of setup or type uh a Chelsea or Orient was definitely like a no-go. Yeah. Um uh, straight not long after that, I start really I put myself into my room for like six weeks, didn't want to come out at all, didn't want to talk to anyone. Even I sound strange, but even my mum, mm. I was really paranoid. Like people coming in, how are you, son? I'd be like, Yeah, I'm all right. Don't ask me a question, sort of thing. Like I just want to stay in bed. I felt safe. I think I just felt safe in my room. I just didn't want to be, mm. I don't know, I, I was just struggling. Um, yeah, so and then the phone call came in. Now Terry was like ringing the FA like daily. And I used to think to myself, like, why is he trying so hard? He's got no reason to sort of help me. Like, why does he keep coming up trying to help me, sort of thing? Which was nice because I was upstairs and I could hear him downstairs. But he kept like sort of battling for me. I could hear him on the phone talking to the FA, like saying, like, what are we going to do about this? This is sort of scandalous and whatever else. And then he just said to me, look, son, you can't play for any of them teams no more. You can't go for an academy. What we'll do, he sort of just like, I think he was thinking more of my mind, like just to sort of just bring me back down to earth sort of thing and sort of instead of just going so like over the top and sort of high profile. He said that we just get you a normal club, local club, and sort of just let you bring yourself back together. And then, and then we'll sort of go and look to try and come again at a later date. And, that, and that's what I did. I joined a local team, uh, say local team, say 20 minutes away, just in Essex. Which is, I'm in Hertfordshire, but just enough, just further enough away to sort of keep me out of the eye locally. And I did that for one season. Um, and then I started getting scattered again. And I'm trying to, then I saw him come back up again. Yeah. So those, those next few years, it, it never seems like, it quite clicks, you know. It seems like you lose your desire a bit for the game. You never fall back in love with it. You keep doing it because you're you're good at it. There's a Crystal Palace mm. trial where you walk off the pitch. And can can you kind of give us a sense of where you were with you and and football then? Because you might think, okay, there's still a chance here. You know, you've gone through this mm. horror show, ten to fourteen, turfed out for a year. Terry, your you, you know family friend, keeps coaching with you. There might be a sense of someone who hasn't read the book yet thinking, okay, he's gone through this horrible time, but he's still at an age where you might get a YTS program or whatever. Like yeah. there's there's still a chance and, and you just don't seem to ever find yourself on a pitch again. Yeah, well that's it. Like you said, I go to uh I go to Palace and I'm training, doing doing really well, playing games from this, that, and the other. And in and, and, and a bit of time, I think 18 months I might have passed by that. I might be 15 and a half, yeah, coming towards 16. And, I'm, I'm, and I've done the year from 15 to 16 uh, at uh, at Loughton, the type of club I said. And the next season, like, it gives me one season to try and get an apprenticeship. Um, and I end up at Palace, like I said. And um, right at the end of the season, uh, on, a, on, a, on a random Sunday, News of the World, double page spread. That my dad had done a piece with uh, whoever he'd done it with, just said, my football breaks up my family. And it just mentioned all the clubs, how much they had offered me, Villa offered me a, offered my dad a, a home abroad and a job and Manchester United this and whatever else. All the, he just sort of just went out and I think it was his like last hurrah, let's say, and just like, like I'm going to tell him everything. Mm. And obviously get a few quid. I think it was like £24,000 for a, for a media article uh, in News of the World. And I see that. I'm at, I'm at that time, I'm at Palace. That was on the Sunday they come out. And on the, on the Wednesday, they said, we've got a game at Tottenham. I played against Tottenham at their training ground. And then, because I think that piece had come out before, I built this pressure. I knew people was going to be watching like any time, like ever. Do you know what I mean? This has just come out. This is when there was no social media. Whatever you listen to or see in the news of the world was like gospel, wasn't yeah. it? Do you know what I mean? So like, I'm I'm playing, I'm turning up for the game, thinking, putting to myself with this pressure. Like I've got to literally do miracles. I've got to take on everyone top bins, at tricks and everything else. 
Anyway, I take a few touches. Nothing really goes terribly wrong, to be honest with you. But mentally, I just feel like I'm back on that roundabout again. Mm. I'm back on that roundabout again. I'm just like, everything's happening too fast. And everything's just like, I'm pretty much having a panic attack, maybe, or some type of breakdown. Uh, and I just walk off the pitch and just, just say to the, uh, Martin Sprocket, who's the manager, I said, like, I'm injured, I'm injured. I, I think I might have been holding my leg as if I have done an hamstring or something like that. But realistically, I hadn't done anything. I just wanted to get off the pitch. Mm. Uh, I got off the pitch and uh, and sat in the changing room. And I knew I knew then that it was sort of over. I sort of knew that football, I wasn't going to be a football player no more. And then that takes me only a few days after that. I mean, I end up at... Uh, archway in uh, in London, Suicide Bridge, they call it. And uh, I'm on my bike with all my friends. We drove past, oh, it go, you have to go up to a hill to get to the top of it where the bridge is. Then it goes back down. We go up to the top of it there. I put my brakes on, all my friends carry on down the hill and I stay at the top. Mm. And obviously when you're kids, they don't even turn around, do they? I quickly put my bike there and I walk back to the bridge. And then I'm, I'm at the top of the bridge and I'm thinking like, that's where that's that's sort of, that's where it got me at the end yes, of the day. Yes. That's, and then, yeah. Yeah. No, it's 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 uh, horrific, really. Um, the, the next number of years, I mean, putting your life back together, trying to leave football behind, having to deal with everyone you meet, going, "Oh, you're, uh, oh yes, Sonny Pike, what went yeah. wrong? Uh, all of that yeah. stuff." What what was that like then? Trying to, I guess, become an adult and find your way in the world. That's it. Yeah, like you said, just going in. I'm, I'm, I'm. I turn into. Uh, I go and work for my friend's building company. Going into pubs like Sunny, Sunny, how are you, mate? You're like, what happened? What happened? And you're like, yeah. oh, like it's a book. It's, it's you know, complicated. It's, 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 it's <laughs> take it. Take it. Take it. Like, listen, we're going to do, and we're going to get a good. Hopefully, you get a good, good idea of the story. But like, when you're sitting there thinking, I just want to have a drink and I just want to yeah. have a good night, and then you've got yeah. about four or five geezers hanging off the side, you're trying to explain to them everything. You're just like. Oh, it, it did be a bit, it'd be, a bit of it'd be, a it'd be easier if you could just say injury. Yeah, so yeah, 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 it'd be nice, yeah, it'd be brilliant. I could just, yeah, broke my leg, done, job done. Yeah. But it, it's so complicated, like so much went on. But now, mm. to be fair, over the last two weeks since the book's come out, I'm just like, yeah, go and read this book and then come back and talk to me later. Do you know what I mean? That's like the little perfect little thing for me now. If you, if you really yeah. want to know, you can read the book. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and was it a difficult period then? Kind of like, did you find it as the money and everything in football has gone, you know, and, and, and it's, it's such, I guess, it's a dream world. Did you find it hard to look at the game? Did you find it hard to cope with having a, a quote unquote normal life after kind of tasting and touching fame and, and being so close? Yeah, yeah, I did. I struggled for a while. I mean, a couple of times after I stopped playing, because after that, I went to Stevenage. And then, and then I come away from the game completely. Com completely. Mm. And I, it says in the book, I get a phone call randomly from Sam Allardyce asking me to go and join Bolton. And, and I get a little spring in my step, like, oh, I, I'm going to go and play in the Premier League. Uh, I had to go and get fit. And I couldn't even last for three weeks trying to get fit. Um, so I had little, another little couple of spring, little couple of situations where I almost got back in. Mm. But realistically, like, I couldn't watch it for probably close to 10 years. I couldn't watch football. Yeah. Mm. long time I just couldn't really watch it I just I think it was a build up of frustration but I associated all the drama that had gone on off the pitch with the yeah. game yes. which obviously now as an adult it's just like I'm realistic do you know what I mean there's nothing wrong with the game the game's a sport's a sport I love playing the sport there and, and I coach kids and do all the good stuff now but then I just associated with like just stay away from that it's just not worth the drama it's not worth the aggravation even if it was watching it friends asked me to go and play five side I'd be like no 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 I, I've been close to, close to 10 years. I didn't even touch a ball. Mm. Mm. It doesn't seem like you managed to repair the relationship with your father either, which is, I guess, one of the great sadnesses of the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. No, no, nothing. Nothing as of yet. You know I mean, you never know. But when, when my book was getting, that it was going to come, that I got a deal, a, a, a deal, he did send a message over social media, said, if you need any help and whatever else, and I just sent him a nice message back saying, that thanks for the help. If, if I need any help, I'll let you know. And, and that was that. But I still, I still haven't seen him face to face since the conversation I told you about over the school. And that was like 20, I think it's like 23 years ago. That was literally the last conversation I had with him. Uh, so yeah, no, nothing there. But I mean, as I said, I'm so far past everything now. Uh, just wishing everyone all the best, really. I'm not really mm. too bothered in either way. And, and so, you, yeah, you're not too bothered either way. Because I was going to ask, how does that sit with you? Because I guess 
life is so short and none of us are going to be around forever and it, is it okay if that's how it's left with you or is it even it must be very sad and difficult even though i understand why there might be some anger there i suppose yeah no i mean i'm the thing is i've built such a, like, a good <clears throat> foundation of like i've learned about how to to sort of live the right way and do the right things i mean it's just i'm not i know i'm fine as i am mm. but like as i said you never know what happens i've actually had over the last few weeks since the books come out a handful of people looking to do documentaries this that and the other and i know the angle like they're talking about netflix this that and the other and i know well i will never be surprised if it was like they meet and that scene happens yeah. do you know what i mean so yeah. you never know you never know what's going to happen I, I, yeah, you never know what's going to happen, really, do you? Yeah, you get a little glimpse there that you can already see how the media works. You've got a certain understanding yeah, yeah. of it now. I, and I, as soon as the book come out, I said yeah. to my missus, Rosie, she's only too glad. I said, do you know what's going to happen next? I said, it'll be a documentary, this, that, and the other, yeah. and whatever else. But, like, listen, my thing is now, I've sort of got to a stage where I can sort of talk about my story a lot now, and mm. I know that it's sort of doing a good job for other people. Mm. And And... Even yesterday, I did something yesterday for FIFA, a mental health campaign called Reach Out. It was like me with like all like Cafu and like well-known legends football thing. And it's me sort of uh, putting my message out for, because I think they use the players for like ex-players that might be struggling with mental health, but with me talking to like say kids that don't make it. Yeah. And I think they're using That's me terrible. to that sort of pass that message. And they asked me a question yesterday and said to me like, uh, what was the good points and the bad points? And then I went up when I got to, I said the bad points, but when I said the good points, I actually sat there in a chair and thought to myself, doing now, what I'm doing now, like what I'm doing with you, if I know that's helping someone, that's the good point for me. That's mm -hmm. where I'll get the good sort of buzz out of it, if you know what I mean. I think to myself, like, yeah, to be fair, like a parent might be listening to this now, having a kid and think to myself, you know what, I'm not going to, I'm going to just sort of take it a bit, not take it easy with them, because I know they understand that kids have to work hard to do things. I'm not one of these people who turn around saying, oh, just see what happens. Listen, you have to work hard to be a football player, but maybe just sort of manage it in the right way. Mm. And maybe as as a parent and, and a kid, they can enjoy it more with it being so so intense. You know what I mean? Because I coach kids now, and I can ask, I, and especially if they're in academies, the pressure that runs through the family, especially like when they think, oh, I've got a game or it's retaining release, I sort of understand all that now. And I know like my story is going to help people. Yeah. So that's the sort of good feeling I get. Hey, look, there's so much money involved. Kids are the winning lottery ticket for families, you know? That's the yeah. hor horrible reality in certain cases. So a final one, Sonny. Life now, I know you're a big family man, coach the football, as you said, have your own little academy and everything. I think uh, Black Cab driver over in London as yeah. well and, and, and yeah. taking along with a nice, ordinary, uh, at the moment anyway, documentary, free life. <laughs> exactly, yeah. No, just a very, it's weird because I like, I just love the sort of being stable, just like being able to just go to work, come home, have me dinner, talk to my kids. And like, it probably sounds proper boring to some people, but I'm like, yes, that's like the best thing I could ask for. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's yeah. what I needed back then. I just needed that sort of normality sort of thing. Because um, it bits we didn't, just thinking about it, like when I stopped playing football, there's even bits where I sort of slide into sort of criminality and this, mm. that and the other. And it, even that, my normal life after football wasn't normal. Mm. It was that even went off the radar. Uh, so now, for me to be just like live and just go work and like be in the cab or coaching like I do here where I am, um, it's just so nice. Yeah, just love yeah. it. Happy, happy days. Listen, you did really well to get it back on track because it could have been just very difficult yeah. to live with that whole mess. So um, yeah. <laughs> the, the book, as I said, is, I'll hold it up here again, Sonny Pike, The Greatest Footballer That Never Was, and it's out now if people fancy a read. So, Sonny, thanks so much for the time. Great to hear you. OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward.